call everyone to order. Right. Good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting in 2015 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please just remind everyone present to please turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices. We have received apologies from Malcolm Chisholm and Mark MacDonald today. I would therefore like to welcome their substitutes Jackie Bailey and Bob Dora to the meeting and invite first Jackie and then Bob to declare any relevant interests. Thank you. It's already uh, publicly available on the Parliament website. Well, thank you very much for that. Our first item of business today is to decide whether today item 7 in private. Are members agreed? Mm -hmm. Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business today is to take evidence on the forthcoming UK budget from Paul Johnson, Director of the Institute of Fiscal Studies. I'd like to welcome Paul once again to our a meeting. doesn't seem like a year since he was last here. And invite him to make an opening statement. Paul. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll only make a very brief um, opening statement. Um, we start off with where we are in terms of the, uh, the economy. The economy um, is growing, uh, but in terms of national income per head, we're barely back to where we were pre-recession. And in terms of people's incomes, we think probably people's incomes are roughly back to where they were pre-recession, but still haven't actually reached their peak in 2009. So for all that things are turning up, it's still been a seven or eight year period, which has been almost unprecedented in the sense of um, the, the slowness of recovery. Um, and it's that slowness of recovery and the slowness particularly of growth in income and earnings, which uh, results in the difficult position we remain in uh, from a fiscal point of view. Um, our expectation is that the deficit this year will turn out at around £90 billion, which is uh, roughly where the OBR thought it was going to be back in uh, December, but actually more uh, than they thought at this time last year, and uh, obviously something in the order of £60 billion more uh, than was expected back in 2010. And that's driven entirely by the slowness of growth, the slowness of growth in incomes, and therefore uh, the slowness in growth of tax revenues. Um, that doesn't leave the Chancellor with a great deal of room for manoeuvre in the um, budget coming up here next week. Um, there's been uh, a bit of speculation that he might have money to spend. Um, I can't see where that money would come from. Um, because inflation is very, very low, he will be spending less on debt interest over the next year than he expected. Uh, but if he's to behave in a way which is... Uh, symmetric with how he behaved when things were getting worse. Uh, when things were getting worse, he didn't um, tighten uh, fiscal uh, fiscal numbers in that year. Uh, it would be very odd to loosen them uh, in a year in which things look like they may be getting just a little bit um, better. Uh, he could, in terms of you know the sets of things he could do um, in the budget, uh, I think they will require some. If he wants to be giving money away, he's going to have to take money away from somewhere. Um, obviously, we're in a um, pre we're, we're running up to the uh, UK general election, um, so uh, it's worth thinking about a set of other options into the longer run. Something I'm sure we'll come on to uh, in a minute is where um, the uh, various party spending plans take them and how that relates to the figures in the um, in the autumn statement. The figures in the autumn statement clearly imply some really dramatic spending cuts over the next um, four or five years. Um, uh, actually, it's not clear that any of the main parties are properly signed up to those uh, spending cuts, which creates a, a degree of confusion about where we will um, actually end up. But uh, clearly, if we do go down that road, um, we have got an awful lot of cuts to come. The numbers in the autumn statement are consistent with uh, cuts of 40% over the period from 2010 to 2020 in unprotected um, departments. That's the scale of the change that they imply. My guess is that's not what's going to happen, because as I said, it's not clear that anyone is fully signed up to uh, uh, fully signed up to that. Um, whichever way we go post-election, it's going to be um, a difficult few years. All of the parties appear to be signed up to the cuts for 2015-16. Exactly how deep they will be is actually something I think we will learn in uh, the budget. Um, significant cuts were planned for 2015-16 in real terms, but because inflation has turned out to be so much lower than expected, the real terms cuts 
currently in the um, uh, in, in the public finances are less dramatic than originally planned. Look out for whether the Chancellor decides to take some more cash away to achieve those real terms cuts. If we follow uh, what the minimum um, set of cuts, which appear to be consistent with the Conservative plans, look like after 2015-16, that still implies substantial additional cuts for most departments. If you look at what Labour is planning, that, that's consistent with much, with really very significantly smaller, um, smaller cuts than, uh, that, than is implied by the Conservative plans because Conservatives are looking for an overall budget balance. Labour is looking for a current budget balance, which gives them 25 billion or so of additional uh, room for manoeuvre. Uh, the flip side of that, of course, is that if you follow the, um, uh, the, the Labour plans, you end up with somewhat more in the way of debt and borrowing uh, at the end of the Parliament. And that's where, it seems to me, the kind of big, um, the big fiscal choices and indeed the big political uh, and um, uh, general election choices lie. I'll stop there and um, happy to follow up on any of that. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much. I mean, you've obviously been to committee before. What I intend to do, obviously, is start with a few opening questions from myself and uh, across a, a number of areas, and then no doubt colleagues will want to explore some of these in, in, in greater depth as we progress. I mean, the first one we talked, you, you touched on, is obviously the issue of borrowing, and you, 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 you know, you've, um, you, you basically said that uh, only Japan will have higher structural borrowing in the UK in 2015. This is despite the UK having done the seventh largest fiscal consolidation since the crisis uh, began. So is that basically just uh, because the government has been unable to reach its growth targets? Uh, w what's the, the reason for, for that state of affairs? Uh, yes, essentially it is because uh, growth um, over the parliament as a whole has been so much less than originally hoped for. Um, and the government has responded to that not by um, imposing additional uh, spending cuts or additional tax increases. They've essentially kept to the um, fiscal numbers that they initially, they, they've essentially kept to the spending and spending rates and tax rates that they originally pan, planned back in um, 2010, moving things around a bit, but, but, but the overall effect has been the same in the face of a much worse fiscal situation. Um, what they've done is kick the problem to some extent down the road, which is why, uh, I mean, the other thing that we say here is that in terms of planned fiscal consolidations over the next four years, we have the biggest in the um, OECD. Uh, so we've had a, a relative to the size of our original deficit, we've actually had a relatively restrained um, fiscal consolidation over the last five years. Uh, but because we've done that, we have the biggest planned consolidation over the next five years. That's all been driven by lower growth, as you say, and then the response of the government has been not to tighten further in response to that growth, but to say that they'll tighten further later on. Postponing some of the pain, in effect. Uh, you know, one thing we discussed last year was the issue of productivity, and you said that the key puzzle is over why productivity has fallen so much. Um, I'm just wondering if you've got any further answers to this puzzle of productivity which does seem to be a, a great concern because obviously if productivity increases that would resolve a lot of these uh, these issues to some extent at least um, so I wonder if you've got any um, answers if you like in terms of the, the the relationship between productivity and pay and why the productivity has not uh, improved as, as one would have expected at this at this point in the cycle. Um, probably no more than I had last year. I mean, you're, you're, you're quite right to, to, to raise that um, again. That is clearly the very poor productivity performance has been um, behind the very poor uh, levels of earnings growth, and that in turn has been behind the very poor levels of um, economic growth and um, fiscal uh, and the fiscal um, situation. Um, I, I don't think we. Uh, no more than we did a year ago in terms of what's driving that. There is clearly a role uh, for the financial sector here and the way in which um, it remains difficult for new um, businesses to um, uh, to get hold of finance, but has been relatively easy for, old, for, for, for existing businesses to do that. It's clearly related to some extent to the very high levels of employment growth. A lot of that employment growth has been in um, uh, relatively low paid or low productivity work but actually if you look at the if you look at the labor force itself it's uh, much more it's really significantly better educated than it was seven or eight years ago the proportion of the labor force that is graduate has grown uh, quite significantly if you look at the overall distribution of where um, uh, people are working there there hasn't been a shift to less high skilled or obviously less productive 
industry. Most of this appears to be happening within um, industries. Uh, so lack of investment, um, there's certainly been a fall off in investment which um, in, in, in machinery and technology and so on, which impacts on uh, productivity. You've got a lot of new people moving into the labour market which impacts on productivity. Um, you've, got the, uh, you've got the effect of what's happening in the financial services sector. It's probably bits of all of those things, but there remains quite a puzzle on top. Yes, I mean, you, 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 you talk about, uh, about the, um, a widespread retreat from risk by investors resulting in considerable decline in its asset prices, and that's in terms of your analysis of the global economy. When looking at the UK, you also say that the biggest threat with the widespread retreat from risk which pushed the UK back into recession in late 2015. I mean, how, kind of, um, how big a risk uh, uh, is that? How big a threat is this reduction in... Uh, people wanting to, to take risks in terms of going forward with investment plans, etc., to the UK economy? Um, so, I think worth saying those are the words of Oxford Economics rather than um, mm. us at the IFS. Yeah. Uh, it's very, I mean, I, I think Oxford Economics' view is that that's a relatively, a relatively small risk. I don't think they see that as the, anything like the most likely, um, most likely outcome. And indeed, if you look at, um, if you look at revised ONS figures, it looks like investment has been um, picking up um, over the last uh, over the last year or two, but it's um, you know we, we are in this kind of uh, we, we remain in this extraordinary world where um, uh, interest rates have been at their lowest level ever now for five or six years. We've got hundreds of billions worth of quantitative easing. Um, we have a very big deficit in this country and most other countries, and yet uh, the return on that debt is extraordinarily low, which is itself an indication of the desire of investors to um, uh, invest in relatively low risk, even given the debt, um, they see um, government gilts as, 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 a, as low risk and worth investing in, um, despite the very low returns, which is telling you something about the extent to which they are um, uh, uh, not confident um, in what's happening in the, uh, in the rest of the economy. So in a kind of um, odd way, uh, it will only be really when we start to see um, the return on some of that debt growing that we'll know that um, uh, investors are beginning to be more confident in in, in investing in, uh, in in the in the real uh, in the real economy. The fact that so much money is pouring into um, government debt, you, even when you'd think returns ought to be high but aren't, uh, is itself an indication of the difficult position we remain in. How much money do large businesses actually have in terms of cash stockpiles? Because I know that's again that's something you touched on uh, over the years about a lot of businesses have got money, but they don't, don't don't necessarily want to actually risk spending it, you know, investing it because of the concerns about long-term economic future. There remains a lot of money in the corporate sector. I think it's worth saying that um, some of the numbers that uh, were being talked about a couple of years ago have been revised down a lot because of um, uh, problems with ONS figures. Mm -hmm. Uh, nevertheless, it's in the hundreds of billions of um, it's in the hundreds of billions of pounds, and I think again, you know, with respect to the your, your previous question, it's evidence of the relative continuing lack of confidence in um, in being able to invest that effectively. Though, as I say, the, the situation, and this is one of the difficulties with all of this, the situation is not as dramatic as was thought a couple of years ago, because the ONS have pretty substantially changed their view of history. Um, both in terms of the amount of money that companies had and indeed in a positive direction in the terms of the amount of investment they've been doing over the last few years. But of course confidence is critical because you know I mean you need uh, people to invest to stimulate growth but if people think there's not going to be growth they don't necessarily invest so you end up with that, this, that kind of, uh, kind of um, non-virtuous cycle one could say. Yeah, and the um, I mean, I mean, in terms of confidence, I mean, there is a remarkable you know who knows whether they'll be right, but there's a remarkable degree of agreement among um, the economic forecasters that the UK will grow at two two and a half percent over the next um, several years. Um, I think it's two things that's worth saying about that. First, the consensus is that that means that we've essentially lost pretty much everything. Um, that was lost in the crisis and the years following it forever. I mean, there's no sense. Nobody is really predicting three, three and a half percent growth over several years to catch up on what we lost um, uh, pre-crisis. And secondly, um, there is clearly a lot of concern about what may be happening, uh, particularly in the international markets, particularly in the eurozone, 
um, uh, and the effect that that may have on uh, on the UK in the short run if things start to go wrong there. So there remains a lot of risk out there um, in terms of the UK economy itself. There is um, my perception of the um, of the forecasters is there's a remarkable degree of consensus about a reasonable steady recovery over the next few years. Thanks. Now, when, when, I was quite interested in um, your, your comments about the the issue of chartered accountants of England and Wales and their perspective in terms of whole of government accounts. I know that John here is an accountant would be particularly excited about this uh, particular issue. You know, and, uh, and uh, in, in 2012-13, the accounting deficit of £179 billion pounds was £94 billion more than the current deficit of £85 billion reported in the national accounts. I'm just wondering if you can talk us through what the implications of this uh, change could be. The, um, so, so what the um, ICAW ha have looked at is um, is looking at the financial, uh, the, the public finance figures, in a different way to the standard mm -hmm. national accounting um, framework. And I think if you do that, you do learn some interesting additional things about the both the level of um, commitments and the change in those commitments. Now. By far the biggest of these is um, commitments to public service pension um, payments. So certainly if you look at the um, overall uh, debt um, in terms of the balance sheet, uh, you see a very large number in there uh, for future uh, commitments to, um, to public service uh, pensions. Um, you, and this is, I mean, these are uh, legally binding commitments in some sense and therefore ought to appear on the balance sheet. And there are other things in there like um, private finance initiative, um, uh, commitments and contracts, um, uh, decommissioning for nuclear and so on. So, so there's a set of things in there which we ought to be thinking about and worrying about. Um, these numbers change year by year, particularly again on the pension side because of changes in expected uh, longevity or changes in uh, in the discount rate so that uh, one, see, one ought to be taking into account in some sense how that, um, how that level of future commitment changes. I think one of the difficulties in interpreting these figures is that um, uh, you have to kind of, um, you, you have to uh, put a, a break somewhere on what you consider to be absolute commitments going forward. So public service pensions are in those numbers, but um, state pensions aren't, and that's because there is a different kind of legal commitment to, um, to state pensions to the commitment to public service pensions. PFI contracts are in there in full, although in some sense you could probably renegotiate some of those or, or, or chop them and pay people um, earlier. Things like the education budget and so on aren't in, or the NHS aren't in there at all, and yet actually the implicit commitment is so strong uh, that, 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 um, uh, that you know, perhaps, they, you know, perhaps you think they ought to be. On the other hand, um, you know, the government is different from any company in the sense that it has a permanent capacity to tax its citizens as much as they'll allow them to be taxed. Uh, and so on the positive side of the balance sheet, you might want to put it in, but that's not how those rules work. So, so I think so long as one understands the limitations of this and is clear where the, um, where the line is drawn between things that you put into the balance sheet on, on that and where you don't, I think it's, it's, a, it's a helpful way, an additional bit of information. The last, the, the last thing I'd say on that is um, it draw, the, the, the um, Office of Budget Responsibility long-term um, finance uh, forecasts which look at um, pension commitments, health service commitments and tax receipts going down the road essentially look at that same kind of information but in a cash flow year by year Way, which is, an, I think, an, a, another useful way of thinking of the scale of commitments that we've got into the future and our capacity to fund them. Fascinating stuff, I must say. Um, now, of course, one of the, 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 the things which is, forms the meat politically, of course, in terms of the green budget is the issue of options for fuller departmental spending cuts. And uh, you point out that uh, um, the government uh, plans um, imply real departmental spending cuts of 9.5% between 2010-11 and 2015-16, but you then, go, you, you then go on to add that uh, 2014 autumn statement plans imply real cuts to departmental spending between 2015-16 and 19-20 of 14.1%. Uh, um, so basically that's uh, uh, deeper cuts over a short period of time. I mean, what are the implications for Scotland in, in, in those cuts, assuming that those are rolled forward? 
Well, um, uh, most of those cuts um, flow uh, directly through uh, to Scotland through the through the Barnet formula. I mean, it's um, it's worth saying that the scale, because of the way that the Barnet formula, formula <laughs> the way that the Barnet formula interacts with um, uh, re revenues from business rates, um, up till now the impact on Scotland has been a bit less than uh, the impact on uh, on England. Uh, we haven't work through the exact Barnet consequentials of these changes, but um, you know, broadly speaking, one would expect that they would have a similar effect on Scotland uh, to, to, to the effect they have on the rest of the UK. Okay, thanks for that. And, and I mean, the, the Office on Budget Responsibilities forecast that these cuts to departmental spending could lead to some 900,000 uh, job losses in the public sector to 2020. Now, I, I take it there's a number of scenarios that could be painted. Obviously, that's uh, in, in, in relation to the autumn statement. Uh, what's your view on those kind of figures? Uh, I think those, um, I mean, our calculations um, on the same basis as what the OBR has done um, come up with similar uh, similar results. It's um, it's very hard to see how you can make cuts of that scale in public spending and public service spending at that uh, without making big cuts in the numbers of people employed because after all the workforce is something like 60 or 70 percent of spending um, on public services so you can't make big cuts in public service spending without making cuts in the workforce unless you can um, you hold pay down to a really remarkable uh, extent. So there's obviously a kind of trade-off. If you've got a certain amount of money, you can um, spend a certain amount on the pay bill, and that can be more people at less pay or fewer people at more pay. Uh, one of the things that I think will make um, all of these um, figures even more difficult to achieve over the next five years than they have over the last five years is that over the last five years, we've seen pay in the private sector do really extraordinarily badly. Uh, which has made it relatively easy to hold pay down in the public sector. And indeed, um, pay in the public sector is only just... Um, so the first few years of this parliament, pay in the public sector was high relative to the private sector because private sector pay fell so quickly at the beginning of the recession. Public sector pay has fallen much more gradually. They're pretty much now back to their relativity pre-recession, public and private sector pay. If private sector pay continues to grow, as we expect and hope that it will, then it's going to be quite hard for public sector pay to be held back indefinitely. Another year or two, possibly, but, 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 but not indefinitely, because then you start paying public sector workers significantly less than what's available in the private sector, and that, um, that's not something that it's easy to maintain uh, in the long run. So, the, um, so, so then, then you are left with a, a world in which the only option is to, if you're going to meet those kinds of spending cuts, is to reduce the number of uh, public sector workers. So um, large numbers of public sector job losses um, are certainly you know, the most likely consistent um, outcome uh, or outcome consistent with the scale of the cuts that are um, suggested in the autumn statement. There's, I'm sure we'll come on to, I think those, you know, are those cuts like actually likely to happen? Um, I suspect they're less likely than they, they're less than 50% likely to happen, even under a Conservative government. Why that to be the case? Um, that's essentially because, well, for two reasons. First, I think it's just extraordinarily hard to achieve. Uh, but secondly, because it's not clear actually that the Conservatives are fully signed up to the numbers in the autumn statement, in the sense that they have. Uh, I, mean, I mean, they have said that what they want to achieve in terms of their fiscal uh, targets is a budget balance, not a 1% of national income surplus. And indeed, the Chancellor has said in front of the Treasury Select Committee words to the effect that he felt that he could use some of that um, planned surplus as, uh, as a buffer for tax cuts or, 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 or easing, easing some of the spending cuts that they, um, that they imply. Now, I don't know, and I think it's one of the difficulties of... Um, looking forward, I don't know exactly where the Conservatives are on that. I don't know exactly where Labour is on the speed at which they want to get to their current budget balance. What we do know is there is a difference between them. You know, one of the things you obviously talked about, we talked, touched on productivity earlier on, you talked about the impact on pay in terms of the NHS specifically, because you're talking about uh, the need for the NHS. I think the figures were uh, something like £30 billion pounds is required in terms of enhanced um, you know, NHS productivity um, if, if uh, we're going to continue to deliver the, the kind of uh, services that are required going forward because of additional pressures, etc. So what you're saying is that um, in, in terms of the NHS specifically in England and Wales, there's a real uh, issue that if, if 
you know, salaries are not kept, um, you know, relatively close to private sector growth, then we'd have real difficulties in terms of attracting, retaining staff who are well-trained, well-educated and uh, are able to deliver. Is that, is that correct? Yes, I think that's true. That's true across the public services. I think you, um, uh, you, you, you can't get significantly out of line in terms of the uh, paying conditions with what's in the private sector and, and expect to uh, continue to be able to recruit people and retain people of the quality uh, of the quality that, that, um, that you want. And that's, that's one of the difficulties about funding public services like the NHS into the, into the long run, where we know that uh, measured productivity at least doesn't grow as quickly as measured productivity in the, um, in, in the private sector but you have to increase um, earnings consonant with uh, earnings in the private sector if you want to continue to attract people of a similar quality. So yeah, indeed. Yeah, indeed. Okay, now, um, one, of the, one of the things um, obviously you're looking at as well is, is um, the options for just um, spending on Social Security, all of which appear to be fairly unpalatable, as I'm sure most people would suggest. And, um, there is an implied concern that um, the protection of pensioners in terms of um, social security spending means a, a particularly disproportionate impact on people of working age. So I'm just wondering if you can talk us through some of your thoughts on that particular issue. I think that's um, so. I think if you're uh, so, the Conservative government or the Conservatives have said they're looking for 12 billion of cuts on the social security budget. Now, you could think of that as 12 billion out of 220 billion, which is the entire Social Security budget, but they've also said that they want to protect fully pensioner spending. So it's actually 12 billion out of the 90 or 100 billion that goes to uh, non pensioners. And that's obviously a much, I mean, that's, that's, that's a more than double proportionate effect on, um, on that group. So there's a kind of arithmetic effect, which is if you're going to take 12 billion from 120 billion, that's um, whatever that is, that's 5%. But if you're going to take 12 billion from uh, 90 billion, that's whatever that is, 13 or 14%. So, so arithmetically, it's just more difficult to, um, to achieve if you're going to take it only from one part uh, um, of the budget. Uh, clearly, um, in addition, you, uh, the, um, the non-pensioner social security budget is more focused on those towards the bottom of the income distribution. The large majority of it is uh, means tested, um, or it's going to people who are um, sick and disabled. It's pretty difficult to take money away from anyone else through the social security budget, other than um, what's left of um, other than what's left of child benefit. And so, what do you think the logic is for the government's view on that, other than the other than electoral reasons? What do you, why do you think the government is deciding to focus on one specific group within the, the within the receipt of social security payments? Well, I, c I couldn't comment on the political element of this. I mean, I think, the, um, I think there, are, there are two things you might think. One is that with respect to pensioners, um, once, you're, you know, once you're significantly past pension age, you're retired, uh, there's not much you can do to change your um, income. So to uh, impose cuts uh, at short notice um, is not something that you, you, you can respond to very easily once you've um, hit pension age. So I think there is a... Uh, you know, there is a certainly a strong reason for not doing anything dramatic to the incomes of people who can't do very much to respond to that, particularly if you think that they've um, arranged their affairs over a long period in order to uh, meet what, um, you know, what they're expecting from the state. I mean, that said, you know, policy has changed quite a lot in, uh, in that area. So I, mean, I think that would be, you know, if you wanted to, um, uh, if you wanted to kind of rational reason for um, protecting pensioner benefits. I think that would be the one that you would use. Um, I mean, with respect to um, those uh, below pension age, I think uh, doing two things are worth um, noting. Whilst there have been significant cuts under this, um, under this government, for significant groups of the population, the system is still much more generous than it was at the end of the 1990s. So we still have a significant tax credit system, which is still significantly, uh, very significantly more generous, for example, to low-income uh, families with children than was the case um, even back in 2001 or 2002. So it's always important to be clear about the baseline uh, that you're comparing these things against. Um, and then you've got the difficulty of controlling budgets like the housing benefit budget, where despite um, significant discretionary cuts in the generosity of housing benefit, 
real spending has continued to rise, and that has continued to rise because rents have risen and because um, incomes have been uh, so low. I mean, the truth is that um, the government has found it very, very difficult to reduce um, spending on uh, Social Security over this period because um, there, are, there are continued upward pressures. I mean, you've said that uh, giving exemptions from cuts for groups deemed more vulnerable can weaken work incentives and strengthen incentives for people to have children or claim disability benefits. I mean, that's um, you know that uh, I mean that that flows from the, the the sort of the nature of the system. Clearly, if you have a means-tested benefit system, then you increase the um, incentive for people to um, take those benefits and not to work. Now, how how important those incentives are. Is open to um, is open to some considerable dispute, and for most groups, they're probably not um, they're probably not terribly important, but they're clearly there in the system. Okay, and you've said that um, um, many of the policies suggested by Conservative Labour parties, withdrawing winter fuel payments from higher and additional rate taxpayers, cutting housing benefit for young people, reducing the benefit cap, and increasing child benefit by one percent for a year, would reduce spending by relatively little. Um, how much are we talking about in terms of the overall picture of the social uh, security? So I think, uh, I think I think this is kind of an important part of the debate about um, uh, cuts in social security spending. So if, for example, you take some of the things that this government has done, the so-called bedroom tax or the getting rid of the spare room subsidy for social tenants, that saved um, a small number of hundreds of millions of pounds. Uh, the... Um, uh, the, the capping benefits at whatever it is, £24,000 per household has saved maybe £100 million, um, when actually there have been £17 billion worth of savings, most of which have come through um, freezing benefits and reducing the rate at which they go up, first from RPI to CPI and then to, 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 to 1%. So, what, so I think one part of the political debate here, which is very important, is that, that those things which have got the headlines, things like the, um, uh, the bedroom tax and the, uh, the, the, the cap, have saved very little compared with the total savings, which have been spread across much broader sets of people and have been slightly more hidden. Um, going forward, again, it's in terms of having a sensible debate, um, to suggest that you would save um, a measurable amount of money by taking uh, winter fuel payment from higher rate taxpaying pensioners is odd because you wouldn't. You would save maybe at most £100 million or so, which is um, you know, almost lost in the roundings when you're looking at £220 billion um, budget. Uh, when uh, increasing things at 1% when inflation last September was 1.2%, clearly doesn't save very much. I mean, obviously, if you increased it at 1% when inflation is 3%, it, it saves a great deal more. So I think it's important to get a sense of scale here. If you really want to save, I mean, as the Conservatives said, if you want to save £12 billion, pounds, well, they've told us about, about one, one and a half billion of how they'll do that. They haven't told which, which is by um, the 1% um, uh, indexation. Um, they haven't told us where they're going to get the other £10 billion from. Interestingly, you, you also say that introducing a separate mansion tax would be unnecessarily complicated when council tax could be brought up to date and refocused on higher value properties. Yes, the, um, I, mean, there, uh, I mean, there is a significant problem uh, with the way that council tax um, works, both in the sense that it's based on values back in 1991 uh, and in the sense that it is regressive. In other words, the amount you pay goes up less than proportionately to the value of your house uh, and it's capped. Um, so what the what the mansion tax, what the proposed mansion tax does, in a sense, will be to um, uh, layer on top of that something which got rid of some of that regressivity for um, you know, a group of houses at the very top end of the distribution, and therefore helps a bit. Uh, but a more you know, complete reform would say, well, let's um, uh, let's value, revalue all properties and uh, charge council tax uh, at a flat rate proportion of the value of the house rather than at a uh, va proportion of the value of the house that falls um, as the house becomes more expensive. Now you can do that in all sorts of um, in all sorts of different ways and clearly that would have a rather different distributional effect to simply sticking a mansion tax um, on top but but you can I mean you, in a sense you can think of a mansion tax as sticking uh, additional bands on top of the current council tax system. Now I'm just going to ask one question one other day and I'm going to let colleagues in which is about and you've basically talked about um, uh, about sensible ways to raise more revenue from the taxation of pension saving 
Uh, but the widespread proposal to restrict income tax relief on pension contributions to the basic rate is misguided. I'm just wondering if you can tell us why you feel that to be yeah, the case. So, um, uh, I mean, there, there are significant problems with the taxation of pensions, and there are elements of the taxation of pensions which are extremely generous relative to what you might think of as a neutral system. Um, but actually, the, the income tax treatment of contributions to pensions are not part of that. So I mean, it's, it's a, it's a long-standing um, view of most economists, actually, that an appropriate way of taxing saving is to tax it once. So you save out of pre-tax income, and then when you take the uh, income later on in retirement, say, you pay tax on it at that point. So you are, um, you, you're, you're taxing saving once. To tax saving twice um, is to um, disincentivize saving and actually to create quite a lot of complexity so that the way the income tax system treats pensions at the moment is not is is, is pretty sensible from that um, that point of view and a, a lot of the numbers bandied around about the costs of doing this are somewhat misguided because um, if you start to tax money that's going in now then you lose some tax revenue um, in uh, in the future it also depends what is the thing that you're comparing uh, your system to that said there are at least two very big elements of the pension tax system, which are extraordinarily generous. One is um, you can currently take a tax-free lump sum of more than £300,000 if you've got enough money in your um, pension, and that's money on which no tax has ever been paid. Um, and particularly now that you don't have to buy an annuity, it's hard to know why you would, um, uh, would incentivise like that. Uh, and the other bit which is extraordinarily generous is the treatment of employer uh, contributions in the sense they don't attract any national insurance contributions either at the point at which they go in or the point at which they come out. So that so they're exempt from national insurance contributions entirely. Employee contributions to pensions aren't exempt from national insurance, but employer contributions are. It's probably why about 70% of contributions come from employers. Um, uh, and you might well want to... Um, uh, you, if, you might well want to change that, for example, by gradually putting an additional... Um, national insurance surcharge on pensions in payment, um, which you might want to kind of increase over a, over a long period, or by um, uh, charging, that, um, charging that up front. So I think, if, I think our main point there is if you want to, uh, if you think there's a problem with the taxation of pensions, it's probably not um, the income tax treatment up front. It is probably the income tax treatment of lump sums and the national insurance treatment uh, for employee, for employer contributions. I did say the last question, but I'm going to ask just one more, I should say, before letting colleagues in, exploiting my position in the chair. Yeah. Um, and it's just that, the, the, in, in terms of additional fiscal consolidation, you talked about uh, the proposals are that 2% would be from net tax rises, 98% from spending cuts, um, whereas in the current parliament it's been an 18-82 split. Um, obviously, I, I know you don't want to get into the politics of it too much, but I mean, is that a, does that seem to you a reasonable balance to be struck, or a sensible balance from an economic point of view? Well, I think you've, I mean, you've, 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 you've obviously got a, you've obviously got a choice there. Um, I think you know, up to a point, um, you can see why a significant majority would come from spending cuts, because um, if, if you, know, for example, if you'd taken 60 spending cut, 40 tax increase, you would have ratcheted up the um, uh, spending as a proportion of national income. And if you wanted to get back to um, pre-crisis levels of spending as a proportion of national income, you were always going to be doing um, a majority of this from spending cuts. Uh, if you look at the um, autumn statement uh, plans, and if all of that comes from uh, spending cuts, then you don't just get back to pre-crisis levels of spending as a proportion of national income. You get back to very low levels of uh, spending as a proportion of national income, probably the lowest since the last... War. So that's clearly you know, a big choice about the size of the uh, about the size of the state. And if you wanted to get to the same level of um, you know, one percent of national income um, surplus as the autumn statement numbers uh, suggest, and return the state to roughly the size that it was over the two thousands or indeed nineteen nineties and two thousands, then you would do more of it through tax and less of it through spending than is. Uh, than is suggested in uh, than is suggested by the um, the numbers in the autumn statement. So, do you believe that the chancellor is planning a fundamental reimagining of the role of the state? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I do think that. Um, I mean, I genuinely think that to get to you, 
to, to impose an additional 50 billion of spending cuts, which is what the autumn statement numbers imply, uh, would be extraordinarily difficult, particularly if you're going to protect health, pensions and schools and so on. That, that would imply for unprotected departments between 2010 and 2020, cuts of 40% on average. So they're on average 40% cuts for defense, transport, environment, police, justice and so on. Um, that just feels like a set of very big cuts. <laughs> Uh, the first uh, person to ask questions from committee will be Jean to be followed by Gavin. Right. <clears throat> Thank you, convener. Good morning. I wanted to uh, ask you uh, on a couple of uh, statements, just that I think there's a general, a general feeling that we would like to get to a place where um, there was a, a, a more fair society. And, and reading the paper, it doesn't seem that that kind of discussion has driven anything in the budget. I mean, you've just said yourself just now that it was extraordinarily generous uh, to allow people who have over 300,000 in a pension fund. Um, and that, that there seems to have been uh, generosities given to those who could can afford, and yet uh, the hardest cuts falling. I mean, we know on, on savings that the 20% of the poorest people in the country have less than a week's income in savings or ability to spend. Um, and just on that theme, um, you say that in, uh, on, the, on the idea of increasing tax, uh, either on income tax or national insurance or VAT uh, by 1%, increase any of these would weaken work incentives. Um, I would say that work incentives currently, I wonder if you would agree, are, are weakened at the peop for, the, for people who are on the lowest earnings and yet we see no concentration on any suggestion of increasing a minimum wage uh, and to, to compensate for the fact that we may raise tax and indeed the people at the lowest end should be exempt from paying tax in any case. Yeah so um, there's quite a lot in, um, uh, in that. Um, uh, in terms of work incentives, you're right. I mean, the, the, the biggest issues in terms of work incentives are for those on the lowest wages and those on the lowest incomes because of the way in which the uh, mean excessive benefit system treats people. Um, uh, actually, it's very hard to avoid something like that. If you're going to give money to people when they're out of work, you can either take it away very quickly when they move into work so that you, um, you're, you're having a significant work disincentive effect on a relatively small group, or you can take it away much more slowly, and then it come, you, you get sort of big marginal tax rates much further up the um, distribution. And we've shifted that quite a lot in the last 15 years with the introduction of um, in-work tax credits. So um, that actually, in-work tax credits gave people a significantly additional incentive to move into work, uh, but then when the tax credits are taken away as your earnings rise, um, gives you a significantly, a, a, a really small incentive very often to increase hours of work, which is why we've seen lots of people working exactly 16 and then exactly 24 hours, because that's exactly where the, um, where the incentives bite. And you can see that very, very clearly. Um, that that's, what, uh, that's what people do. Um, if you look at the um, plans uh, for universal credit, whether that comes in or not, uh, eventually, I don't know. Uh, but universal credit takes a slightly different view of this. It doesn't give people a very clear incentive to move to 16 or 24 hours of work, uh, but it does give um, some incentive to uh, work at 5, 10, 15 hours because it, takes, uh, it gives you um, a, a, an amount that you can earn before anything is taken away, and then it's, uh, and then it's tapered away slightly more uh, gradually than you get certainly the, under the under the income support system. Uh, so you know, these, uh, that, that's a judgment about whether that's, um, you know, uh, whether that's the, uh, the, the most effective uh, way in terms of work incentives. Um, in terms of the sort of, uh, if you look at the fiscal consolidation overall and thinking about the fairness issue which you um, raised um, at the beginning, I think there is a, there's, a, there's a very particular pattern that you see in terms of, if you're just looking at taxes and benefits, who's, who, who's been affected by the changes um, since, uh, since the recession of 2008. Um, you've clearly had cuts in working age social security benefits. So people at the bottom end of the working age distribution have lost um, 
the p people in the sort of middle, middle to upper middle of the um, uh, distribution actually actually lost very, I mean, remarkably little of, of being really uh, protected from uh, tax and benefit changes on the whole, largely because such a huge amount of money has been spent on increasing the personal allowance, and that has largely helped people uh, in the middle and upper middle part of the um, income distribution. And then you look right at the top, uh, and then there have been a, a series of really quite big tax increases which have um, hit people at the at the top of the distribution. And so they've they, they've lost not not just most in cash terms, uh, but most as a proportion of their income as well. And at the top, I'm talking about the top five percent or so uh, of of the distribution. So you've you've hit the bottom through the social security cuts. You've largely protected people in the middle and upper middle, and then you've taken a very large amount away from people right at the top. to continue that for a second, would you agree with the um, Understanding Society Policy Unit at the Institute of Social and Economic Research? And they revealed that the top 20%, in fact, uh, have an average of, of improved their wealth by 64%. I mean, that is extraordinary. And at the, at the bottom end, so really rather more dramatic than you're suggesting might be the case that they are actually being taxed. They are currently much better off in terms of savings, job security, uh, pay rises, uh, and really every, every aspect. They may be paying slightly more, but they are still gaining at an extraordinary rate since uh, before the recession, in fact. I don't know what that 64 per cent, which, which, what period does that refer to? This is from 2005 to 2013. Right, so my, my guess is that's largely driven by housing, uh, house prices over that period. It's, um, so uh, I don't, I'm not familiar with that particular piece of work, but certainly um, over that period, um, if you go back to 2005, there has been an increase in asset prices, there's been an increase in, in house prices, and those, therefore, that are um, owners, uh, owner-occupiers and are holding uh, assets will have, uh, will have seen um, significant increases in their wealth over that period. This is probably... Um, uh, um, Focus. So, 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 to the extent that you know, owner occupiers and those who have wealth in ISAs or pensions or what have you have gained from increases in asset prices, that doesn't particularly surprise me. That does mean that that group will have been getting better off. And clearly, if you're in terms of the wealth distribution, if you're the bottom end of the wealth distribution, the sort of half or so of the population who, who have very little in the way of assets, then in um, absolute terms, they're not going to have seen uh, the same the, the same growth in their wealth. I think one thing it's worth Adding to that is if you look at particularly wealth but also income, um, you've seen a, a real difference by age or generation. Mm -hmm. So the groups who have gained most here are the older groups. Uh, if you look at incomes, um, those over 60, um, particularly those over 65, have seen their incomes grow since 2008. Everyone else has seen their incomes shrink uh, since 2008. And certainly if you look at wealth, um, uh, clearly that's very much concentrated, as you'd expect, among people um, over the age of um, 50 or 60 as, they've, uh, as, as they get towards retirement. And earlier cohorts are not going to end up with the same amount unless through inheritance. Uh, proportion of the, the numbers who are homeowners in their 20s and 30s is much lower than a generation ago. So we've halved the number of people in their 20s who are homeowners relative to a generation ago. Um, there are no occupational pensions outside of the public sector for, uh, for people um, uh, entering the labour market who have entered the labour market in the last 10 years or so. So the distribution by generation um, has changed or is changing, um, is, is changing quite significantly. And, and would you agree that there's not much hope in, the, in, the, in the, your own analysis for changing that? For changing which? The that situation for the different generations? For the people at the top end of the earnings getting richer and the people at the bottom getting poorer? Um, so, uh, is there, I, I wouldn't say there's not much hope. I mean, I think, the, you know, again, if you look at the period since 2008, um, we have, inequality has not increased in terms, of, um, in terms of incomes, partly because earnings have done so badly and earnings at the top have done quite well. And let's be clear about terms here. When I say the top, we, we don't know much about the top 1%. Uh, but but the sort of the nine percent below that, their earnings have grown actually less than um, uh, than average over that um, period, and benefits uh, up until now at least have risen uh, somewhat faster than earnings. That's sort of mostly a reflection of how very badly 
um, earnings have done over that period. So if you look at inequality of income in the UK, it had a massive, massive increase in inequality during the 1980s. Um, over the period from 1990 to 2008, across most of the distribution, you didn't see much changing in terms of inequality, but you saw the top 1% or 2% continuing, <coughs> continuing to race away. So um, actually over the 2000s, if anything, you saw a little bit of reduction in inequality among the bottom 98%, and then the top 2% absolutely racing um, away even further. In the period since 2008, uh, what you've seen is certainly among the bottom 99%, a slight compression in the distribution, but essentially it's been flat. We don't really know what's happened to the top 1% um, over that period, such that inequality now, certainly across the 99%, is roughly where it was at the end of the 1980s. There's, there, there hasn't been much change in inequality other than that top 1% in the last 25 years. Okay, and, and just finally, if I may, the, the, um, we recognise that the, I think you actually said uh, there were h hundreds of billions of pounds uh, resting with business and through lack of confidence of investment and so on. What is the reluctance to have some of that spent in, in abolishing zero hours contracts and increasing a minimum wage? Because just as, as, as business is, is generating uh, money, there's no obligation to pay those at the bottom end any better uh, salaries in order that it would actually uh, get over this the 16 hours um, curb, if you like, that where everything kicks in and they're, and they're worse off if they work above <coughs> that level. Yeah, well, I, think, I mean, the, the, the decision over the minimum wage is made by the Low Pay Commission, who take a view about essentially um, how much they think they can increase the minimum wage without having an impact on employment. And it's, a, I think, incredibly difficult judgment to make about at what point do you start to have an impact on employment by, uh, by, by raising the minimum wage. It has actually risen over this whole period more quickly than um, average earnings. Again, a, a reflection of how, badly, um, of how badly average earnings have done. Um, there may well be scope for, um, uh, for, further, uh, for, for further increases in it, depending on one's view about what impact that might have on, on, on levels of employment. Thank you. Um, Gavin, to be followed by John. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Johnson. Um, maybe just start with, with something Jean Urquhart asked about quite late on. Um, in your response to a question about inequality, I've written it down, I think you said basically since 2008, inequality hasn't increased, and if anything, there's been a slight, a slight compression, but it's broadly flat. Now, that's obviously slightly different to what one would read in the uh, media uh, on a fairly regular basis. What, what's your data source, or what's your... <coughs> Um, back up for, for that particular statement? Uh, so the period from 2008 to 2012-13 comes from um, households below average income data, which is um, uh, based on a big survey called the Family Resources Survey. It's produced by the um, DWP on an annual basis. Um, we have um, uh, forecasted forward to the current day um, that those numbers from 2012-13 on the basis of what we know from other surveys has been happening to earnings and the distribution of earnings and what we know has happened to the tax and what we know has happened to the benefit system so we can give a pretty, uh, a, a pretty good sense of where things have changed over, over the two years since those most recent, um, official, uh, those most recent official figures. And they, and, and, and they show you know, broadly what I, uh, what, what I suggested. Certainly over the period of 2012-13, um, you saw uh, a significant compression in inequality, actually, uh, partly because um, uh, benefits were rising quite a lot more quickly than earnings because earnings were falling so much relative to inflation. Um, over the two years since then, you've seen that opening up a bit because benefits have been doing worse than um, earnings uh, over that period. If you take the period as a whole, you've got something close to um, not, much, you know, not much change in the overall level of inequality, perhaps a little bit, as I say, of compression, but I think you know, the, the, the broader story, as I was saying, over 25 years, is you've had sort of small ups. So you had this massive increase in the 80s, small ups and downs since then for most of the population, but the top one or two percent really racing away. I can't really tell you much about what's happened to the top one, one or two percent, partly because the HMRC have not made data available for the last four or five years, which would allow us to do that. Um, okay, we focus on next week then. I mean, if 
you said that you don't think the Chancellor's got a huge amount of room for manoeuvre in terms of, of what we uh, will see next week. But if you were a, a betting man... Uh, what I'm not you, a betting what man. Do you, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, suggesting you were. Um, but I mean, just in, in terms of what, what are the sort of things that you might expect to see next week and are there particular things that the IFS are, are looking out for? Um, well, I, I mean, the first thing, as I, like I said earlier, to remember is there's an awful lot happening anyway. So one thing I would expect is some re-announcements of things that have already been announced. So, um, and it's worth just um, I'm recalling some of the main things which, which are due to happen in April anyway. One is quite a big increase in the personal allowance to £10,600. One is a, a penny off the main rate of corporation tax from 21 to 20 one is the introduction of the um, transferable allowance uh, between um, uh, husband and wife where you know, neither is a higher rate taxpayer and one is not using their full allowance. So this, this will be a small gain to a small proportion of, um, uh, of married couples. Uh, a freeze to fuel duties um, uh, and, and a bunch of other things. So the, uh, the, the Google tax, the diverted profit tax, all of these things have been announced. So, so even if the Chancellor said nothing next week, there'll be a lot of change in the tax and, uh, tax and benefit system in April. Um, what, what else might he do? Uh, well, it, he might, as I said, decide to impose greater cash spending cuts on departments for next year, next financial year, uh, than are currently planned. Uh, because inflation is so much lower than expected and therefore the planned real cuts are less than was initially intended. If he were to do that, then he might say, well, I've, I've, in, you know, I've increased these spending cuts by one or two billion. I'll use that to give away in uh, one way or another, which may be a, a further increase in the personal allowance or, or what have you. Um, it's worth, if you look at the coalition agreement, um, uh, it says explicitly uh, there will be no cut in inheritance tax until um, the personal allowance reaches £10,000. Well, the personal allowance has, has, has gone through £10,000. It was clearly part of the Conservative manifesto to reduce inheritance tax. Um, uh, the, the Chancellor might decide this is the time to make good on that. Um, though note the public finance, he, he has previously said that the inheritance tax threshold will stay where it is until 2017, I think. So that would be a bit of a, uh, a reversal. I mean, it's interesting to, um, you know, as an aside, Inheritance tax has gone up under this government because the, um, the, the threshold has been held constant in nominal terms. It was cut very substantially by the last government, which is kind of sort of political topsy-turvy in a way. Um, the, you know, he may decide to do something political uh, in the sense that um, Labour has uh, announced a £3 billion increase on pension taxation to pay for its um, uh, um, uh, cut in student fees. Um, the Chancellor may decide to say, well, I'm going to take that money and use it for increasing the personal allowance or something. Um, so those are the sorts of things. Uh, but you know, no doubt he'll do a bunch of things I haven't thought of. Um, you talked about, in your, your earlier answers to the convener, you talked about the borrowing for this financial year being, I think you said, £60 billion more than was initially planned at the um, uh, emergency budget back in 2010. Obviously, a, a number of things happened since then. Some people will say that the borrowing is higher because we've had lower growth, and it's because well, obviously we have had lower growth. Um, but some people are saying that that is all driven because they they tried to reduce spending too fast, too deep, too quick, and all that. Others will talk about the uh, huge spike in commodity prices that happened around about 2011. Others, of course, talk about the euro crisis and the. Uh, six quarters of, of uh, retraction that uh, most of our trading partners had. I mean, what is what is does the IFS have a, a sort of official view or analysis as to what happened, or do you do you simply report on the figures, or do you do you have a sort of reasoning why you think things are different from what was projected and uh, or hoped for in 2010? I mean, we don't. I mean, we don't do our own sort of macroeconomic analyses. I mean, I think all of the things that you mentioned are are part of the story. I mean, clearly. Um, you, Clearly, a big reduction in government spending does have an impact on growth in the short run. Clearly, what was going on in the Eurozone um, had an impact on growth. Clearly, what happened to commodity prices had an impact on growth. One would hope that that will you know, move in the other direction now that oil prices uh, are, uh, are, are so low. So all of these things had an, had an effect. I mean, one thing I think is pretty clear is that um, had the government imposed less austerity and we got a little bit more growth, 
we would have a bigger deficit than we have at the moment. We might have a slightly bigger economy, but it's, it, it, it's, it's implausible that the multiplier would be so big that you could, cut, that you could um, increase spending and reduce borrowing. Um, you might have um, not, not have increased borrowing. You probably wouldn't have increased borrowing by as much as you increased spending, but you would, uh, you would have increased um, borrowing. So I think the, you know, going back to my initial um, answer, a series of things uh, created um, lower than expected growth, including just the sort of um, overhang from a, a financial crash, which tends to have longer term uh, consequences than I think people realised back in um, back in 2010. And the government, so the reason the government's now borrowing more is it then decided to um, put off the consequences of that in terms of austerity later rather than further spending cuts earlier. Okay. So, um, so all, all of those factors played a part. I mean, does, does the IS have a view, though, as to what the relative impact of each of those measures were? Or you, you, you're clear that all of them had an impact, but it, have you done any work to look at what was the relative impact of, on each of those measures? Uh, we haven't, no. no. I think the OBR has, made, has done that kind of analysis, and in particular it's looked at why it got its um, forecast wrong back in 2010, which is quite, a, you, quite, quite an interesting analysis. Um, and it puts some of that down to... I, mean, in it, I can't remember the uh, relativities, but it, it does give some sense of which it thinks are the most important, and it, 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 it raises all of the issues that you raised. OK, thank you. Um, if we go on to then your, the, your green paper or your green budget, um, I've dealt with the first questions from the first couple of chapters. So chapter four talks about, I guess, what the prospects are for the UK in the coming year or a couple of years. Um, the, the pattern of unemployment in the UK is very different from most countries within the Eurozone. I mean, Germany is obviously an exception, but the, the rate of unemployment, while still higher than anyone I think would like, is, is a lot lower than most countries within the Eurozone. Why, why do you think the unemployment is very different from the UK, in the UK from other countries across Europe? Well, um, I mean, there are clearly one or two countries which have just had an even bigger demand shock sure. than we have. So, that, you know, if you look at Spain and Greece, they've just had a, you know, a bigger economic shock, and, um, and, and that's had a, a bigger effect on their, um, on their employment levels. Um, but your question, in a sense, is one of these ones where it gets very difficult to um, sort out which direction causality is moving in. So the fact that wages have stayed low has made it, easier for firms to hire people on relatively low wages, but equally the fact that there's been a, you know, a, a big effective supply of labour has made it easier for companies to keep wages low. So which way that causality runs is quite difficult to, uh, it, it, it's quite difficult to determine. I mean, we do have, a, to some extent at least, a, um, a, a labour market which allows these um, changes more easily than um, some other countries. So. Um, allows firms, particularly for younger workers, to reduce pay uh, relatively significantly. And they clearly, um, they have reduced pay for younger workers a lot, um, uh, which is good in the sense that it means there are more in work, is bad in the sense that those in work are doing, uh, are doing rather badly. And we have, a, you know, over the last 20 years, governments of both um, complexions um, have changed the uh, benefit system, uh, both to uh, push people into work in the sense of, um, uh, it, well, to help people into work in, uh, in the sense of the, um, the, the help that they get at Job Centre Plus and so on, to push people into work in the sense that they uh, more easily lose benefits if they don't move into work, and to give them incentives to go into work in the sense they go on to tax credits if they, um, if they get into work. And then in addition, you've got things like um, increased numbers of um, part-time jobs. And one of the things we say in here is that... Um, uh, you know, whilst um, the employment rate is back to where it was in 2008, uh, the underemployment rate remains higher than it was in the sense that quite a large proportion of people now in part-time jobs say they would like to be, in, um, uh, be working more hours, uh, which is different to where we were. Um, and, and finally, you've got uh, increases in, um, in self-employment, which um, appear to be uh, very often at low levels of uh, low levels of pay. So, th 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 as with all these things, there are multiple aspects to to, um, uh, uh, to what's happened here. Somewhat to do with um, long term rather than short term government uh, government policy. Something so somewhat to do with the structure of the labour market um, in the UK. Somewhat to do with the scale of uh, demand shifts. Somewhat to do with the flexibility that individuals have shown in being feeling they have to or being willing to uh, take jobs. Okay. Thank you. Um, but in, in that same chapter, you also talk about business investment, and I think there's a, a desire on, on the part of all political parties and 
uh, to see more business investment because that's going to lead to a longer term recovery and a more sustainable recovery instead of relying on consumer spending. Um, what, what's the, I mean, what is your prediction or projection to that? Do you think we will see a big increase in business investment? Because it's been, the, I guess, the one area that uh, has, has been one of the areas that's been a little disappointing in the last three or four years. Are you more confident about that for this year? Again, we don't really make um, forecasts of that. I mean, one, th one thing that uh, um, is clear is that it hasn't been as bad as it looked. So the ONS has um, it really dramatically changed their view of history <laughs> over the last four or five years. Uh, and business investment hasn't been quite as bad as, um, uh, as was previously expected, uh, as was previously thought. Uh, but clearly for the, um, uh, for the recovery to continue, um, business investment will have to you know, grow somewhat faster um, and that will um, you know, depend on a whole uh, on a whole host of things um, that happen in the economy partly to do with the tax system um, you know, and you know, and some of the changes to the corporate tax system over the last few years have not improved uh, incentives to invest um, re reduction in um, investment allowances and so on will not help uh, uh, from uh, from that point of view uh, but almost certainly the most important thing here is this difficult to measure thing confidence and mm -hmm. Uh, view about what's going to happen to the economy in the future as that builds, then hopefully that will move in the right direction. But you know, I don't have a forecast, I'm afraid. Sure. Okay. Um, uh, if I go to the next chapter, then in your in your paper, I mean, and you mentioned it again today, and it's a it's a stat that's been put out there many times. It's one that we'll reach the lowest level of public spending as a percentage of national income since 1948, which I think is what, what your paper suggests. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that, that's a matter of fact, but just keen to explore, I mean, clearly that is, that is a significant statement, but I'm just keen to explore how significant it is and, and is there a risk of sort of over-dramatizing that by couching it in those terms? Because there was a graph I saw, which I'm, I'm pretty sure it might, it might have been one of your graphs or um, one of your colleagues, who, which had the percentage of spend uh, compared to GDP over time. And while it, it was the lowest, I think there was something like only a one percentage point difference between next year and I think it was 2001. I'm, I'm going from memory here. Just, in, But in terms of that graph over time, when, when I read that simple statement, one assumes it's been a kind of downward trajectory uh, all the way since then. But is it one of these graphs that fluctuates and, and is it actually as significant as that statement sounds? There's, there's, there's a lot of issues there. I mean, one is that um, you get to um, the lowest proportion since uh, the war only if you, I mean, not, not next year or the year after, but by 2019, um, if you impose the kinds of cuts that are implied by the autumn statement. So there's a big if there. Um, second thing is that if you're looking at um, total public spending, it only just dips below its minimum at the end of the 1990s. Um, if you're looking at um, public service spending, I excluding pensions and welfare, it's, uh, it, 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 it's more, more clearly below where it was at the end of the 1990s. Um, so, we, we, we clearly, so, so, so one thing is we have a choice. We, we're not there. We, we still, there's still a choice in terms of what happens in the last two years of the next parliament. As I say, it's not clear to me that anyone's really signed up to, to that. Secondly, um, in terms of total spending, not very different, really, to where we are at the end of the 1990s. In terms of public service spending, a bit more um, different. Um, uh, what does that, how, how does one interpret that? Well, I mean, one thing that's rather important to think about over this long period is the composition of that spending. So if you look back at 1948, um, something like a quarter of public service spending was on defence, um, and not much of it was on health. And um, it, that, that has flipped completely. I mean, we're now, at, I can't remember what it is on, on, on defence, maybe 5% and 20, 25% on, on health. So, so it's completely different stuff that this money is being spent on. Uh, so it's not obvious that, you know, you might, that, that, that comparing the overall sort of proportion is, um, is not obvious quite how much that's, um, uh, that's telling you. Uh, I think the, 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 the next point to make is that if you're looking into the longer run future, um, and you're thinking about total public spending. Um, there are clearly big pressures um, on health and pension spending from a population which even over this decade is aging really pretty rapidly. Uh, so to, um, to keep um, spending at uh, relatively historically low levels at a point when uh, um, the uh, demands on it are actually growing um, uh, is it, likely to be particularly um, it's likely to be particularly difficult. You might actually expect 
spending as a proportion of national income to rise at a time when the population is aging in, in, in that way rather than to fall. Um, and then I think the last thing to say is you can look at spending as a proportion of national income, but you can also look at it in sort of real pounds per head terms. Now, I, my view is that if you're looking at health spending over long periods, you probably want to look at it in as a proportion of national income, but over short periods, then real pounds per head probably matter more. Real pounds per head spending on public services grew very fast over the 2000s, um, and it will, even on the autumn statement numbers, fall back to about where it was in 2002, 2003, by the end of the next parliament in real pounds per head. Now, that doesn't mean that's buying you the same stuff because you have to pay you know, more for your nurses and doctors now than you did 20, 20 years ago, but that gives you a different kind of metric for thinking about these things. Okay, thank you. And uh, last issue for me, given just the, it was, again, chapter seven of your green budget. It's really just that this, what you talked to the statement you made about real capital spending cuts. Um, I think you basically said they turned out to be lower than planned. Your stats seem to be 13.6% instead of 25.9%. I just wonder if you can expand on, on that slightly. Yeah, it's um, uh, so the initial, the initial plans um, back in 2010, which were inherited directly from the um, uh, previous Chancellor, uh, were to impose really very substantial cuts on capital spending of about, as I say, 25% compared with about 10% or, or less on day-to-day uh, -day, um, spending. Um, each sort of budget and autumn statement, well, not each, but many of the budgets and autumn statements since then have unwound that very slightly. Um, and if you kind of put them all together, um, you've got almost a halving in the rate of cuts that have been planned. Now, um, uh, I think it would have been preferable to have um, had this announced at the beginning because it's clearly uh, not easy to shift investment spending up and down in a sort of relatively unplanned way, uh, but it is, it is quite a dramatic change in the, uh, in the shape of the consolidation over this period. Well, thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, John, to be followed by Bob. Hey, thank you, convener, and uh, good morning. Um, various points, I mean, a lot of points have been touched on already. The, the whole question of the split between tax increases and um, expenditure reductions, uh, the point's made that... Uh, the plan going ahead is that 2% of the savings, if you like, should be made from tax rises, 98 per spending cuts, whereas up till now it's been 18% from tax and 82% from cuts. Is there a right answer to that? Uh, there isn't a right answer, no. Um, I mean, that, that, that is very much a political judgment. Um, the, I mean, as, as I said earlier, um, it was always likely that most of this was going to happen through um, through spending cuts if you wanted to avoid the recession resulting in a ratcheting up in the size of the state. Uh, what the autumn statement numbers suggest is a reduction in the size of the state, um, and you achieve that by uh, doing everything through spending cuts and not through uh, through tax increases. Um, uh, as my you know, as, as my answer one or two of the previous questions implied, that's going to be hard, I think, to maintain. You know, it's hard to achieve and hard to maintain into the long run, particularly given the pressures on, uh, of demographics and other things on, um, on public spending. Um, you know, the, uh, my expectation uh, will be is, is, that, um, is, is that there will be more tax rises than are implied by those numbers, whoever, uh, whoever wins, because we do still have a very large uh, deficit. Every election since at least 1992 has been followed by significant... Um, uh, significant tax increases without us having been told beforehand uh, that they were going to happen or what they were, uh, what they were going to be. Um, so, you know, the numbers in the autumn statement imply the numbers that you suggest. I'd be surprised if that's actually where we end up. And does that impact on the economy, or in a sense, is it just the, the total amount of money in the economy is, is, is whatever it is? So does it matter how it's shared out and where it comes from? Because... You know, if you had a million pounds, I mean, if you take that million pounds, if you put a bit more tax on those at the top and a bit more generous with benefits, does that give you the same result as cutting the benefits by a million and leaving the tax at the top? 
Well, it, um, it, it, well, it clearly gives you a different distributional result. Um, it may give you a different economic result if you think that those on benefits are more likely to spend their money and those at the top are more likely to save their money. So you end up with more consumption in the short run, but less savings and investment in the long run. Right. I um, mean, is, is that proven or is that a theory or...? Uh, I... I, I it, 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 it's reasonably well known that um, th th those with not very much income are more likely to spend it all, and those with more income will are more likely to save it. So you, you, you will get that kind of um, you will get that kind of effect. Um, and then you know, depending how far you take it, you will start having um, uh, you know, work incentive effects at both ends. I mean, clearly at at some point, taxes at the top get high enough that you people stop working or stop paying their tax. Or benefits at the bottom get generous enough that people um, don't have the incentive uh, to work. So you need to get that um, you, need, you need to get that balance as well. But, mm -hmm. yeah, but, but but broadly, you're right. I mean, you just kind of you're taking money from one set of people to another set of people. Um, that leaves the economy with the same the same amount. But the second round effects can be quite important. Yes. I mean, kind of following on that theme. Um, I mean, you, you you make the point. You talk about reliefs uh, at one stage, and that uh, you know by cutting out some of the reliefs, which we've been trying to do with one, some of our new taxes, you, you make a simpler system. I mean, does having a simpler system for the tax, does that have an effect on the economy? Well, um, certainly having a um, sort of efficient and neutral uh, system can have quite, a, quite an effect. I mean, not all reliefs by any means are bad uh, reliefs. You, I mean, uh, we, we talked about pension tax relief earlier. Um, uh, my view is that you, um, you ought to have um, some tax relief for putting money into savings, otherwise you disincentivize savings and you end up taxing it twice. Um, uh, investment relief for corporation tax make a lot of sense because otherwise, again, you're double taxing uh, companies on, um, on investment. Um, R&D tax relief probably makes sense, although it's... Uh, uh, in principle, it may not be uh, at its best at the moment. So, so tax relief itself should not be a dirty word. Actually, uh, you know, a neutral and um, uh, effective tax system may well have quite a bunch of reliefs um, mm -hmm. in it. But you do need to look at each one um, to see whether it is appropriately uh, is doing the right thing within the within the tax system. Um, there are clearly a bunch of things in the tax system which do create economic um, uh, costs. Um, so those you know, those include running you know, a national insurance system alongside an income tax system. Well, that's exactly what I was going to ask you next. But on your <laughs> own, yeah. creates all sorts of unnecessary um, uh, unnecessary uh, complexity. Um, you know, the stamp duty system you know, has economic costs beyond what it needs to have. The VAT system is more um, complex and narrower uh, than uh, in most uh, in most countries. All of these things do create costs and um, you know, moving towards a, um, a, a better structured tax system, it would have, um, hard to put a number on it, but would have positive effects on, on, on the economy. Okay, well, you've already touched on what I was going to ask you next, which was the, the PY in national insurance, because, I mean, well, A, you've got the two systems you're running, and B, the, the national insurance tends to be a bit regressive at certain stages as compared to income tax, which broadly is, is more progressive. So... I mean, playing around, you do mention that, you know, the three main taxes that we could uh, look at increasing would be income tax, NIC and VAT. Um, do I take it then that you feel the economy would benefit from if, you, if income tax and national insurance were combined and then they jointly became more progressive? Uh, I certainly think um, it, it would make life a lot easier if you put the two together. It would also make it more difficult for politicians to um, uh, hide um, increases. I mean, if you look at the period you know, over the last 40 years, we haven't had any increase in the basic rate of tax. Indeed, we've had an awful lot of cuts, and we've had consistent increases in national insurance contributions. Now, there's no economic reason for doing it that way around at all. Uh, indeed, um, given that national insurance hits people in work, um, uh, more than uh, uh, for the same amount of money it hits people in work more than income tax it's a slightly you know, slightly curious uh, way um, of doing it uh, we've also um, uh, got a situation where from uh, next year or the year after we'll have a, a entirely flat rate pension system um, out in which the self-employed and everyone else will essentially um, uh, uh, accrue full benefit to that system. There is now essentially no relationship between the amount of national insurance you pay and any benefit that you're 
uh, that, that you're entitled to. So it really has become um, just another uh, tax on income. So I think you get a significantly more transparency, less capacity for um, uh, fooling uh, the um, electorate, and um, uh, simplicity for, uh, for employers um, who currently essentially have to deal with two entirely different definitions of income to uh, work out what the, um, uh, the, the, the taxes their employees owe is. And finally, you know, we, we would presumably get away from the, the sort of odd situation we've seen over the last several years in which the income tax allowance has risen and risen and risen, uh, and the national insurance point at which you start paying national insurance hasn't risen. And so you've got this two or three thousand pound chunk now on which you pay national insurance and uh, and not income tax, and it's pretty hard to think of why you would design it like that, having actually got to a position in 2009 or 2010 where the two were you know, pretty closely aligned. Mm -hmm. I mean, do, do you think that could have a negative effect on people who are thinking, can I work more, or, because it's just so confusing and people don't know where they are? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't want to speculate on that. On, on, on I mean, again, the, th the three uh, big taxes that are mentioned, income tax, national insurance and VAT, uh, the point is made that increasing any of these would weaken work incentives and hit the rich harder than the poor, although it then goes on to say that the VAT rise would be less progressive. Um, the, the idea of it hitting the r rich harder than the poor, is that is that in kind of absolute terms, because a rich person is going to pay more tax than a poor person, rather than in relative terms? So if you look at... Um, uh, so, 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 clearly, um, so clearly, as you said, income tax is a directly progressive um, tax, uh, national insurance, if you, certainly if you put one pence on all, all the main rates of national insurance, that, that's um, directly progressive and hits the rich proportionately more than the, uh, those on lower incomes. VAT is more complex. If you look at, um, if, if you look at VAT uh, relative to people's incomes, then it looks like people right at the bottom of the income distribution pay a higher proportion of their income um, in VAT than people uh, towards the top. Now, that's curious given that things like food and so on which take up a bigger portion of the budgets of poorer people, don't have VAT yeah. imposed on them. If instead you order people from the lowest spenders to the highest spenders, then you get a much flatter distribution and indeed one which is slightly um, progressive. And spending is probably a better, gives you a better sense of people's, how well off people are over the, over the longer term. So I think it's probably, um, it's often said that VAT as it's currently constructed is a regressive tax. It probably isn't a, a regressive tax, but it's certainly less progressive uh, than Nick's and uh, particularly income tax. Thank you. And the last area which I was being hinted to ask questions about uh, was the whole thing about balance sheets and whole of government accounts and uh, <laughs> so on and so forth. Um, I mean, you made, the, you, you made a few points already about, you know, what is a real liability and what's not a real liability. And was I right in understanding that you're saying it's not entirely clear? Because, I mean, I'm not sure I understand that necessarily a pension liability. I mean, if, if it's in a pension fund, you've got an asset and a liability, so I understand that. But any government pension, be it the basic state pension or any others, um, I mean, surely right now it's not a liability, is it? Uh, well, I think... Um, I as I say, I think there is, a, there is a continuum of these things, and the way that the whole of government accounts works is that um, you know, the, uh, what, what is owed to teachers and civil servants and NHS staff in public service pensions counts as a clear liability in those, uh, in those numbers, although presumably government could decide to renege on its promises or change its promises, and indeed it has changed its promises in the past in terms of moving from RPI indexation to CPI. Um, indexation. So these things are changeable, uh, but um, the, the judgment is that this is, uh, the, the, that on the whole, the pension um, which you promised to a teacher is part of the remuneration package and will be paid pretty much come what may, and therefore it is a, is a liability. Uh, whereas the judgment made in these accounts that the, you know, the promise to pay me a uh, pension of 7,000 a year or whatever it is when I retire is something that could be reneged upon and therefore isn't uh, a liability in the same way as, uh, as, as, a, as a, teacher, a, a teacher's pension. Yes. Now, as I say, it doesn't strike me that there is an absolutely clear dividing line between those things. That is the, um, that is the convention in the um, whole of government accounts, and I think it's the, it's the convention in, uh, in, international accounting, uh, in, in international accounting standards, which is why I think actually it's useful to look at three things. It's useful to look at the standard national accounts, sort of cash flow, money that we normally look at. It's useful to look at it in the way that the ICAW chapter in here looks at it using 
all of government accounts and international accounting standards, but it's also useful to look at it on a sort of cash flow basis going forward, uh, which is what the OBR does when it looks at long-term uh, long financial um, situation in terms of how much might we be spending on uh, state pensions, public service pensions, the health service and so on in 20 or 30 years' time under a set of assumptions about how those things change with the population and with um, productivity and so on in, in, in the health service. So I don't think any of these gives you a full picture by themselves. You look at them together and you get quite a, uh, you, you, you get a useful picture. And the thing that you know, they all show pretty clearly, if you're looking a little bit further forward, is that um, we will be spending a higher proportion of national income on both on state pensions unless we reduce them. We will be spending a higher proportion of national income on health unless we significantly, unless we extraordinarily increase productivity or reduce uh, the quality of what's there. That means, you know, by simple logic, we will therefore either spend less on other services and, um, and presumably be offering people less or will be um, increasing taxes to pay for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to say, I do like the idea of uh, balance sheets. I think it kind of reassures me that we've taken everything into account. Um, but, I mean, I do wonder if one of the dangers is if we focus on all these liabilities. I mean, one of the ways out of that historically has been to encourage inflation, or at least to allow inflation, because that way you whittle away your liabilities. Now, I mean, I, when I was at university, I spent most of my time studying accountancy and how we dealt with inflation, and we just lived with quite high inflation at that time. Um, is that a temptation going forward for any government to really let inflation get going in order to take away some of these liabilities? Well, I think, um, uh, I mean, a lot of these liabilities are pretty much inflation-linked anyway. So if you look at um, if the pension liabilities, they are all um, liabilities assuming indexation largely with CPI um, inflation. So higher inflation doesn't reduce um, those liabilities. Um, Clearly, the same is true of spending on the health service. If you want a real level of um, health spending going forward, then uh, then it doesn't help to do that. There are other bits of the, um, uh, particularly the tax system, though, where high levels of inflation could be used to just sort of the other way around, in a sense, to bring more money in. And I think it's rather odd that we've now got significant bits of the tax system which aren't indexed at all. Uh, so the point at which um, child benefit starts to be withdrawn. £50,000 a year. There's no um, procedure for indexing that. That's fixed at £50,000 a year. Um, our, our, our estimates are that the number of people losing child benefit will double over the next 10 years as a result of that because you're beginning to get into quite a thick bit of the um, earnings distribution. Um, the point at which the 45p tax rate comes in is fixed at £150,000 a year. This government says it doesn't like that top rate of tax, but it has reduced in real terms quite significantly the point at which you start to pay it. Um, at 100,000 pounds, there's a 60 percent rate of tax over a 20,000 um, pound period. Um, that 100,000 pound has been fixed in cash terms since it was introduced in uh, 2010, so bringing more people in uh, and therefore raising um, uh, therefore raising more tax. The pension tax system uh, at uh, maximum you could put in a year at 40,000, the maximum you put in over a lifetime at 1.25 million at the moment, reduced under labor plans, again fixed in cash terms. Now. Um, Inflation helps bring money in through all of these uh, ways, um, I, you know, in, 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 a, in a slightly hidden and uh, inappropriate uh, way. I think you know, most bits of the tax system are indexed to inflation. Why some bits are not is, uh, I think, rather, uh, rather bizarre. Very naughty. I'm glad to um, cover that area because I was uh, my wind up. I was going to be asking about fiscal drag actually, so that's something uh, less to be asked at the end of the session. Uh, Bob, to be followed by Jackie. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, good morning, uh, good morning. Mr. Johnson. Could I just follow up on a, a theme that Gina and Gavin Brown actually asked about <coughs> in terms of um, whether there'd been greater inequality because of the, of the UK government's um, economic strategy and austerity. Uh, program and I heard, heard you say that there have been marginal differences in, in the last few years and usually it's been a slight compression, maybe even suggesting that things weren't as bad as, as perhaps newspaper reports had had suggested. Um, but life isn't a balance sheet. So, I mean, I wouldn't be representing my constituents if I didn't talk about um, disabled people in Scotland, but about 100,000 of them are going to lose about £1,300 a year because of UK welfare reforms or 
single parents and, and how the fiscal situation has disadvantaged them or indeed my constituents that I see weekly have been sanctioned by the DWP and, and Job Centre Plus. Mm. So I know there's a balance sheet by which you do a matrix and you work out how things got more equal or more, more unequal. But would it be reasonable to say that there's a group within society where things have got a lot more difficult and a lot more unequal, irrespective of what the economic balance sheet actually says? Uh, yeah. so, you know, it's clear that um, so uh, th there's a group who have been sanctioned from benefits, and that, that num the number of benefit sanctions has grown really substantially over the last four or five years, and that group clearly will be um, uh, significantly worse off as a result of that. Um, that, that group's in the, you know, small numbers of hundreds of thousands, so its impact on overall measured inequality is relatively small, but clearly for that group that is a very significant change in the way that the benefit system has been administered um, and a significant effect on, 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 their, uh, on their experience. Um, there are clearly groups who are losing um, uh, various kinds of disability benefits as well, um, uh, because largely because of the way in which the uh, system is being administered. Those individuals are clearly again being made um, significantly, uh, significantly worse off. Um, uh, my point really about the overall things is that across the 60 million people in the, in, in, in the population, the average experience of people in the bottom 10 or 20 percent hasn't been proportionately any worse than the average experience of the people in the top 10 or 20 percent. Now, the same proportionate hit to people in the bottom 10 percent may be felt harder, of course, than the same proportionate hit uh, towards, uh, towards the top. And within that bottom 10, 20 percent, there'll be people doing you very much worse than the average, and um, obviously within the top 20%, there'll be people doing better than the average. But if you look at the, if you take just the snapshot of incomes uh, in 2008 across the distribution, the snapshot of incomes right across the distribution in 2015, then there's not been very much um, change in the overall level of inequality. I, I, I'm grateful for you putting that on the record. I, I hope you will appreciate that the, the lived experience of many of my constituents is dramatically different from the, the average experience, if you use certain numbers and, and to, to look to see where inequality is within, within society. So I, I'm glad you put some of that on, on, on the record. Now, um, Mr Mason spoke about um, austerity previously being, a, I think it was 18% based on tax rises and 82% based on spending cuts, whether that's public service spending or whether that's withdrawal of benefits. And going forward, that's going to be uh, two percent tax rises and ninety-eight percent spending cuts. Is that likely to lead to additional inequalities? The fact that that that, that balance has now shifted. Yeah, I mean, I, I just say, I mean, you, w whether that's what the distribution looks like, I don't know. But as I say that's that that's the numbers implied in the autumn um, statement. And I think the answer is um, it, yes in two respects. First. All of what we've described, or what I've talked about in terms of inequality, has just been about income inequality. Uh, but clearly, um, public services, uh, you, the public services you receive are part of your welfare. Um, so uh, what we're not measuring when we're looking at inequality, for example, is the loss of social service, uh, of social care, for example, that some people might experience, or the fact that you know, the library is closed or whatever. That clearly makes people worse off. And public services are more, you know, certainly more important on the whole to people with lower levels of income, and therefore, actually, cutting public services has a real effect on um, on welfare and potentially on inequality if you can measure it in a broader uh, a broader sense. Secondly, if you're not going to do um, very much more on tax and um, you're going to cut benefits, uh, then clearly, cutting benefits on average will hit people towards the bottom of the distribution. If you're not raising taxes, then um, then you're not hitting people towards the top of the distribution. So, all else equal, cutting spending without doing anything on taxes will make the overall distribution, both of income and sort of more general sense economic welfare, less equal. Okay, um, thank you for that. Now, within chapter uh, nine of, of your paper that I, that I read ahead of um, this morning's evidence session, you were talking about the social security system and how how that can be used as an incentive to work or a, or a disincentive to work. And, um, my kind of experience of the social security system has been that it's been a little bit of a one-trick pony. That there seems to be a, a feeling that if you make benefits, uh, if you compress, to use your expression, the levels of benefits, there's a general attrition in benefit levels that, that you were talking about earlier, um, 
and you sanction, there's, an, uh, there's maybe an incentive to move people in, 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 to be economically active, but it's actually a kind of it's a stick policy rather than a carrot policy, and I'm just wondering if the social security system is just not sophisticated enough to deal with with some of that. If I could give give you a couple of examples, I, I've got two constituents in, in North Glasgow who are, are now unemployed because to get their tax credits they had to do additional hours, um, and their employers uh, didn't have the hours available for them to do. And actually, they very understanding employers because they said they were no longer available for work, so they weren't sanctioned by the benefits agency when when they then went to, to make a benefits claim, but people who were going to be worse off in work because of tax credit changes, and I see things like that all the time. Now, you, you mentioned how the tax credit system works and whether a cut-off point, and you can actually focus in what it is worth your while to work and what it's not. Does that suggest that the tapering level of benefits and, you know, and, and more flexibility in the tapering of how long you can keep benefits for and perhaps even more discretion in different parts of the country where the local economic circumstances are, are very different would be helpful. And, and the second example I would give is when I first came into politics, I was told of something called a 104-week link rule, which, which um, I'm not an expert on, but what used to happen, I understand, is that if someone was disabled, um, they may not have the confidence to get into work, and one, you're not actually sure if you can hold down a job, uh, and you're not sure if you want to try, because if you can try, the, you, you might, well, actually, you are fit for work, your benefits will cut whether you get employment or not. And the 104-week link rule used to say, well, actually, you've got two years of trying to sustain that job, and if, you're, if your job breaks down for certain reasons, you'll be put back onto your original level of disability benefits. And it was seen as a supportive way of getting people back into work. Um, so do you think there has to be more flexibility in the social security system to be more imaginative about how we are supportive and get people into work rather than the stick effect, which I feel um, is happening at the moment, as you would expect myself to say, um, uh, being from the party that I am, that that's the kind of thing Scotland could do much more imaginatively to support vulnerable people into work rather than what I would feel would be a, a draconian uh, strategy of austerity currently. So is, is, there, is there benefits going forward and being more flexible with how we operate the social security system? Well, I, th I think you're absolutely right to draw attention to the way that it, the system is administered, and it, we, we, we know for sure that this matters. It matters in you know, in all sorts of ways. So it matters in the so if you if you look back in the early 1980s, for example, it was administered very loosely. Um, people were given very little support to get back into work and very little encouragement to get back into work. We uh, lots of people ended up on disability benefits. Lots of people ended up on in in, in unemployment benefits. Very long run which didn't actually have very much to do with the financial incentives, but had very, a lot more to do with the way that the system was administered. Um, and the, the way the system was administered has changed you know, a lot over that period to provide both, um, you know, certainly stick um, and, some, uh, and some carrot um, as well in terms of the, the administration. Um, in terms of the, um, uh, yeah, and that's actually one of the differences between this, the UK and a number of other European countries, which still, you know, which, 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 which actually, I mean, may be a surprise. I think we have a more sophisticated administration of this system than, 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 than a number of other countries. Um, uh, in terms of the sort of issue about tax credits and uh, the, the, the fact that if you if you're not working the full 24 hours, it's not worth being um, in work. Um, that that's clearly, you know. Under the current system, that is clearly, uh, you know, that, that's clearly true. There will be lots of people for whom there's almost no, there's, there's little or no incentive to work um, anything between zero and 24 um, hours. And if you can't get those 24 hours, then um, th then you're in the position that you describe. Um, uh, universal credit, as I said earlier, if it comes in, will will be different in that sense. It won't have that kind of clear hours point at which things become different. It will have a a, a, a less severe um, uh, take, first of all, it will allow you to earn a bit before you lose anything, and then a less severe taper um, after that. Now, very hard for us to model ex ante what effect that will have on people's behaviour, um, because you no longer have this um, clear point of, look, 24 hours is the, is the thing to do. Um, and you have some incentive to work at 5, 10, 15, 20 hours. In a world where that's all, that, all that's available, then it may be that your constituent would be you know, able and willing to take that kind of uh, work. Um, other, for, for other people, because you don't have that clear um, focus point, it may be less clear to them that it's worthwhile. So I think we've, um, you know, I mean, it would have been nice to, as it were, trialled and evaluated the impact of this, but but, but that's not been, uh, but that's not been possible. Um, 
uh, you know, be beyond that, the way in which, as I said, the way in which these things are administered matters. I would like to see more trialling of different ways of uh, providing um, uh, providing uh, flexibility to local delivery or, or, or trialling different ways of delivering these benefits, actually to see which ones do work. And I think we are very... Uh, you, you, we don't do anywhere near enough, actually, in this country of um, well, uh, of, um, uh, of that kind of testing. It is very much, you know, we will make a big change, and uh, and here it is, which is what's happening with the universal credit, um, without actually really knowing what the effect will be. Uh, it will be very good to see um, local areas um, doing things differently, looking at the effect, and then learning from each other. Um, with the centralised system that we have, we, 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 that, 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 that doesn't happen anywhere near enough. Much convener. Uh, two more questions. Do you have time for two more questions? Thank, thank you. Um, as long as your questions are shorter than the answers, you know. Um, <laughs> 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 Possibly only time for one more question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, half a question, perhaps. Um, I, I was looking um, about uh, pay levels in, in, in real terms pay, and I think the OBR said that, that pay in Scotland was down 4.1% in real terms since since 2008, was the figure I'd taken down from other notes no, notes I, I had. So um, average earnings are well below pre-crisis uh, levels, and, and, and in your paper you, you spoke about actually some people have done okay because if you've sustained your job and you've moved through pay increments and you get more experience, then, then, then things kick in to, to assist you. So I'm just wondering, is there actually, when we look at pay levels being significantly below pre-crisis pre, pre times, is it actually masking an even more severe um, a deficiency in, in, in real terms pay because of the group uh, within society that have actually done okay in terms of they've held on to their job, they've moved through pay increments and that kind of thing? Yeah, I think the, um, uh, I mean, the, the reason we did that analysis in that chapter was because a number of uh, people have been saying, well, look, if you look at, me, if you do what we say, if you, if you look at people who stayed in, in work over this period, then they've not seen real terms cuts. They've actually seen their incomes or their earnings rise over this period. And that's, and that's true. And it's one of the reasons why it's sometimes hard to get across uh, the idea about what's happening across the population as a whole. So... Um, so take people in their 20s. Average earnings of people in their 20s now are about 10% less than they were in 2007. But of course, most people in their 20s now weren't in the labour market in 2007. Most people who were in their 20s in 2007 are now in their 30s. So this is not comparing you know, the same person over time. And actually, most people in their 20s will be seeing their pay rise because that's early in their career and their, their pay goes, goes up. Um, so that's that's a very different sort of thing from looking at the average person in their 20s now to the average person in their 20s in 2007. And we try, don't we succeed, we try to be very careful, therefore, about the way that we describe this, um, that it is the, the average of this cohort relative to the average of um, that cohort, for, um, for example. But what are... So, in a similar way, some people were suggesting, well, look, um, earnings, it's not so bad because um, if you stayed in work over this period, your earnings will have grown. Well, that's true. Um, but that's always true. It's always been true that if you stay in work over a five-year period, your earnings will have grown more than average earnings because you have people coming in, you know, young people coming in at the bottom end of the labour market on less than average earnings, and you're going through your career, you're, seeing, uh, you're, you're hopefully seeing some increase in your earnings as, as you do that. What our analysis showed is that, that there is that gap, but it hasn't really changed over time. The gap now, sort of post-2008, is essentially the same as it was pre-2008. So uh, what you're seeing in terms of the fact that average you know, median earnings have fallen or haven't increased is a real thing, and it's not, um, uh, it's not hiding something different in terms of what's been happening to, uh, in terms of what's been happening to other people. What it does mean um, uh, is, as you say, that there are some people seeing increases in their earnings, and the big thing that you see is this fall in earnings among people in their 20s. So obviously, so said, most people in their 20s now weren't in the labour market in 2007. They're being offered significantly lower pay than people of a similar age um, in, in 2007, and they're, you know, that group, therefore, is significantly worse off than they might otherwise have expected to have been. That's helpful. And my final question, which will be very short, is um, the other committee that I sit on, I'm deputy chair of the Health and Sport Committee, one of the things we, we're keen to map out is how other policy decisions actually impact on 
on, for example, the National Health Service. And I'm just wondering whether the UK government, in doing its economic stra strategy and austerity and, and cuts, uh, do some modelling work about in increased strains that it puts on on a public service sector that is getting significant cuts. So, so for example, whether that's more more mental health issues, whether that's uh, carers feeling greater strain, whether that's pressure on families and how that manifests itself. Has, is, is there any social impact assessment done of UK economic strategy? Because apart from the social justice aspect of it, in economic terms, if in five years' time or ten years' time there's an explosion of mental health issues or even more multimorbidities of older people because of what they've went through in this period of time, society and the government of the day will have to pick up the cost for that to support those people. So has there been a, an assessment, any modelling work from the UK government in relation to any of this? I'm not aware. I'm, I'm not aware of anything like that um, having been done. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, there, there will, within departments, there'll be some of that. Uh, but in terms of the overall strategy, in terms of where the cuts come, I don't. I, my guess is it's not been informed by uh, by very much of that. Um, and my experience is that Westminster finds it quite difficult to take decisions in the way that you're describing. Okay, Jackie, to be followed by Richard. Um, thank you, convener, and good morning, Mr. Johnson. Um, we might indeed be the afternoon before we're finished here, I suspect. Um, I want to explore with you the, the UK budget in relation to Scotland particularly. Um, you're quoted in this morning's papers as saying two things principally. One is that the Conservatives would spend £25 billion a year less over the lifetime of the Parliament um, than Labour would. Um, and also that there isn't a huge amount of difference between Labour and SNP spending plans. Um, assuming both of those are correct, could you talk us through some of the <coughs> headline numbers in relation to what that would mean for Scotland's budget? Um, so uh, let, let me just try and um, uh, say precisely what I meant on the very difference between the, the parties. So if you take um, the Conservatives um, at face value as saying they want to achieve budget balance by the end of the um, uh, by the end of the Parliament uh, and Labour is saying they want to achieve current budget balance that means there's a difference between them of around 25 uh, billion um, or so 25 to 30 billion um, if you take then the SNP um, at face value of saying they want to increase public service spending by half a percent uh, a year over the Parliament um, that's uh, that, that means they're looking to be spending something like seven billion more than presently by the end of the Parliament. That made a difference of, of the order of, I'm, um, uh, I'm doing this from memory, of the order of 10 to 15 billion pounds between Labour and SNP, the order of 25 billion pound difference between Labour and, and, and the Conservatives. That's the, um, that's the sort of orders of, um, that's the sort of orders of magnitude. Um, as, as, I, um, as I suggested earlier, the, the knock-on effects to Scotland would be you know, proportionate to that. So um, you know, this would largely flow directly through, um, uh, largely flew, through, fl would largely flow directly through uh, the Barnet formula to have a similar set of consequentials for Scotland as it has for the rest of the UK. Okay. Um, I wonder whether I could could just tease that out slightly further because the First Minister in a uh, major economic speech that was. Um, delivered in London, suggested £180 billion of investment for the economy would be the SNP's proposals, but at the same time would still be reducing debt. I think you have apparently said somewhere um, that the, the Treasury analysis you believe is right, which is that if public spending was increased by 0.5%, debt would in fact rise, not decrease. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. The, um, I mean, in a sense, it's a simple arithmetic point that even under the even under this government's plans, debt barely falls um, in 2015-16, and that's with quite big cuts in public spending. If you're increasing public spending over that year, then debt rises. I mean, it rises slightly, um, and I think on the, those numbers, debt at the end, uh, sorry, uh, debt at the end of the parliament is similar to maybe slightly more than debt at the beginning of the parliament. Now, economically, whether it's up or down one percent, I don't think makes very much difference. But the, um, but arithmetically. Um, uh, increasing uh, public service spending by half a percent a year will increase debt the first couple of years and then it will fall slightly the last couple of years. 
Okay, that's helpful to know. Um, can I move on to my second question? Because in politics, timing is everything. Whilst we've been speaking, um, the JES figures have been published. So I haven't um, seen them then. <laughs> fresh on of excitement around the room. Um, they, they do indeed point to a continuing budget deficit, um, which we actually believe, based on the falling price of oil, um, will indeed get worse in the next year um, that, that the figures are published for. But can I ask what assessment... IFS have made of the impact of full fiscal autonomy on the Scottish budget in light of the JES position, which indicates the deficit? Um, so, uh, I mean, presumably by full fiscal autonomy, you mean uh, as if all of your spending and taxation were in your own hands and yeah. your own... I believe that, that's yeah. the proposal advanced by the government, yeah. which is that, you know, all of Scotland, Scotland raises all of its taxes for all of its expenditure. Um, I mean, in a, in a sense, this is, uh, I mean, again, a simple piece of arithmetic, but um, uh, uh, outside of North Sea Oil, tax revenue per head in Scotland is very, very similar to average tax revenue per head in the rest of the UK. Spending per head in Scotland is very substantially higher than spending per head in the rest of the UK. Um, uh, oil revenue apart, therefore, um, the deficit in Scotland with full autonomy would be significantly higher. Um, in years up till last year, um, oil, oil money has broadly made that up, and indeed in some years more than made it up. Uh, when oil revenues are falling at the sorts of levels I imagine they're in in JERS this year, and certainly the levels they'll be in JERS next year, uh, then, um, then the deficit in Scotland will be higher than the rest of uh, the, the, the UK. I mean, the, as I say, I think that's, that's simple arithmetic. OK, that's helpful to know. I mean, JERS does seem to suggest it's £4 billion of a gap this year. Um, and people are predicting that it will be higher next. Um, in that context, would you, would you agree that if you are pursuing full fiscal autonomy, you can't also have the Barnett formula? It is one or the other, because it would otherwise be a bit like, you know, you stop paying into the kitty, but you still want the kitty to pay out to you. Well, you can, I mean, again, you can, um, I mean, there's a political decision there. You can have fiscal autonomy with subsidy from the rest of the UK. I mean, that is, you know, that is a choice that, um, you know, that, that the Scottish and UK governments could make about how, how we distribute resources. And indeed, in a sense, is how the UK government has chosen to distribute resources over a, a, over a long period. OK. You think it would be practical or reasonable to expect the government to say, if you're raising your own taxes you know, and you're keeping all of them, we'll give you some extra? It, yeah, it seems to be a political choice. <laughs> Indeed. OK. Um, I think, uh, it, just to develop that, that a little, um, various members of the Scottish Government have said, in, in, certainly in the past year, to my knowledge, um, when the whole question of the Barnett formula was threatened by English MPs, um, that this would result in a £4 billion cut in Scotland's budget and something of the order of 70,000 job losses. I believe both you know, the current First Minister and the Deputy First Minister have both said this. Is that a reasonable assessment, you think, of the impact? Uh, I, I, I wouldn't like to comment on the specific numbers, but it's, it, it's pretty clear, as I said, that there is, um, you know, spending per head in, in Scotland is, whatever it is, 78% or so higher than it is in the rest of the UK. If you were to unwind that, that's a big impact on the Scottish public finances. OK, that's great. And the way of closing that would be to, um, as the UK government are doing, is either to cut services or raise taxes? Yeah. Yep. OK. There was some suggestion, this is my final question, um, that we could grow our way out of this deficit. Um, and there's economic analysis published by the Scottish government within days of each other, two different papers, um, that look at factor productivity growth that look at an exports increase, that look at narrowing gaps in investment so they're more like um, international standards. In total, um, when you take all of that together, it suggests growth over a 12-year period squeezed into four years, a growth rate that would be higher th than China's was in its heyday. Um, is that realistic on any level? I, I'm not familiar with those numbers, but um, higher growth than China in its high heyday sounds quite um, optimistic. The, um, uh, I mean, clearly, you know, the, uh, I, mean, I mean, the analysis that you describe is right in some sense, which is that higher economic growth for, you know, whether it be for Scotland or the UK as a whole, um, it helps, helps you get out of a fiscal hole. And indeed, one, you know, if it turns out that for the UK as a whole, we've lost less permanently of the economic output that it looks like we've lost, then 
you'll need a lot less austerity over the next parliament. So if it turns out we can grow at 3% a year for the next five years without any inflationary uh, problems, then actually a lot of what we've been talking about won't be a problem. Um, the, same will be, uh, the same will be true of Scotland. I think the truth is that um, governments, whether they be UK governments or Scottish governments, find it quite difficult to create growth in the short short run. I mean, I think I mean, there are policies that um, one can think of which most economists would agree on would be good for growth in the long run, uh, but things which are, you know, um, uh, at worst neutral uh, in the long run and, um, and really impact on growth in the very short run are pretty hard to come by. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. What questions on oil and gas taxation? Um, Gavin Brown earlier asked you, uh, Mr Johnson, about what you thought was going to be coming up. Um, in the budget in a whole range of areas and there's been a lot of speculation about what might happen in terms of the oil and gas taxation and, and regime for that. Um, do you have a view of what's likely to happen? Does the IFS have a view of what should happen uh, and what impact do changes in oil and gas taxation have not only in terms of the industry but in terms of the, um, the, the broader picture on government expenditure and revenue? Um, I, I... I'm afraid you're taking me off area where areas where I feel terribly expert. Okay. Um, uh, you know, br broadly, you know, broad economic principles for oil and gas taxation is that you ought to be uh, first. You need a, you know, a consistent and certain regime which is taxing the economic rents that are being earned. Um, and we certainly, you know, over a long, uh, over recent years, haven't had that consistent uh, regime. And it's not clear that we have a regime which only taxes economic rents. If you did have that, then um, the, uh, you, you, would, um, you, you would have a system which didn't impact on the uh, incentives that um, people had to, to, Im to invest in the uh, oil and gas. Uh, in oil and gas, that's clearly not where we are. So, kind of broad, broad principle picture, it would be good to move towards um, a regime which is more neutral and taxes rents in that kind of um, way. Um, in terms of your, uh, uh, you know, given we don't have that system, given we have one that does impact on um, incentives, um, it may be that uh, some of that will change um, in the budget, either in terms of structure or rates. I, I don't know. I won't speculate any more um, on that. In terms of its impact on the, um, on the budget, um, this clearly has an impact on the overall UK um, public finances. Um, these numbers uh, in, you know, in, in the context of the um, whatever it is, six or seven hundred billion that the UK raises in terms of taxes uh, matter, but they're you know, relatively small, clearly a much bigger issue for um, Scotland by itself were it to have full, um, uh, full fiscal autonomy. Um, I mean, the, the, other, the other side of this for the UK, of course, is that um, uh, it, it reduces prices across the Economy and particularly, um, mm -hmm, and particularly yeah. road fuel prices, um, that may allow the government to, for the first time, uh, uh, certainly since 2010, to raise road fuel duties at least in line um, with inflation. I would expect, and you know, one of the reasons that um, you know, economic growth is looking relatively positive over this next year or two is low oil and commodity prices. The long run effect of that will be uh, fiscally positive for the UK um, as a whole, um, but presumably, um, in the short run at least, fiscally negative uh, for an, an autonomous Scotland. So the key issue there is that is the size of the UK economy, that because of uh, the fact it is that, that much more diverse, the government is able to, is more able, is it fair to say, to look at changes to the tax system which may reduce income in the short term but also help stimulate the industry. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, for, for a you know a net user, a uh, net importer of um, uh, of oil, a fall in the oil price is a good thing economically and in the wrong, long run fiscally. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not really very good news for my region in the northeast, but I understand that's one of the benefits we've got of being part of that um, l larger economy that, that there is more that can be uh, done to address the situation. Finally, though, you've mentioned um, Mr. Mason was interested in the issue of whole government um, accounting, as we knew he would be. Um, you mentioned nuclear decommissioning there. Um, just to be, be clear, I mean, presumably offshore decommissioning will be part of those accounts as well because the government's made a commitment of £20 billion of funding offshore decommissioning. So, so, so that figure will be in there somewhere as well. Uh, I presume so. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jean, you want to make a point? <clears throat> yes, I just I guess wanted to 
I'll come back in a small way to Jackie Bailey's uh, statement, which really would open up a huge political debate, of course, which Scotland has enjoyed for the last uh, couple of years, and uh, to challenge some of that. But uh, to go back to the um, very black and white presentation of oil revenues and fiscal autonomy for Scotland, it's also, uh, of course, you would have to look at uh, things like VAT, which, because we are one nation in Europe, there would be adjustments on, on, on VAT returns, there would be uh, you know, services bought and sold and shared that, of course, may well see a Barnett formula still in place in order to make these adjustments. Uh, I'm not sure I follow the question, sorry. Well, I do want to make the point, so I'll labour it if, if I may. Um, you know, every economy will adjust just as the United Kingdom, Westminster, will adjust uh, in terms of a, of a rise or fall of oil prices. And oil prices have been as low as this in recent years. Mm. Um, and, you, you know, everybody expects that they will uh, at some point start to increase again. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, you know, econo economies do adjust. And I hear what the point that's being made that, of course, in a much greater economy, um, that therefore is a, is, would be a greater percentage of, of the Scottish in the Scottish economy as the United Kingdom one. However, the the point is that that industry in fiscal uh, autonomy, full fiscal autonomy, including the oil, would, for example, have other benefits. I mean, already there's discussion about the jobs uh, surrounding uh, decisions in the oil industry are based in London, should be based in the North East. There would be a very, you know, there, there would be so many other aspects of that that to declare it as black and white with full fiscal autonomy and a huge deficit in Scotland really would be uh, quite wrong to give that impression at this committee without much, much greater debate and discussion on uh, aspects of, of Scotland's economy. Would you agree? Yeah, well, it's clearly the case that you, were Scotland to have greater autonomy or, or independence or what have you, a series of different decisions could be made which could have long-run effects on the growth of the um, economy and it may well be that uh, an economy which is um, controlled more locally could grow more, could make different decisions and in the very long run that could make a very big difference to, to growth and therefore the fiscal situation. Um, I think my point really was a sort of a short-run arithmetic point, uh, which is that you, in the in in the short run, um, the the arithmetic would dominate. Would, would dominate in the long run. I mean, I agree with the general proposition that one doesn't quite know what would happen, and it is at least possible uh, that, um, that that behavioural change, that um, additional growth, and so on, would dominate. Thank you. Um, that's exhausted questions to the committee. I've just got a couple more just to wind up on. One, the first one is basically um, based on what's um, being uh, come up in terms of debate, which is regarding the lack of information regarding the top 1% of earners. You said that uh, HMRC have not made data available for the last five years. What's the reason for that? Um, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm referring there to um, the survey of personal incomes, which is uh -huh. based on um, income tax data. Um, <coughs> On the basis of conversations with HMRC, it's, it's, it's down to a lack of resource to do that. Um, I, mean, I, I mean, I slightly exaggerate the lack of information from the annual survey of hours and earnings. We've got reasonably decent information on what's been happening to earnings, certainly in the top 1%, if not the top half um, a percent. And, and looking at some of the tax return data, looking at the impact of the 50p tax rate, we can see some of that. But uh, it's disappointing that the survey of personal incomes, which is uh, an annual survey based on income tax returns, which was uh, it's been available for quite a you know, large number of years, um, uh, has not been made. I, th I can't remember when the last one is from. Might might be as far back as 2009-10. It may, might be 2010-11, but, um, but we certainly don't have anything for the last three or four years. Yeah, it just seemed remarkable given the discussions and debates about top rate of tax, etc. You know, that kind of inf the, the, the resource doesn't, doesn't seem to be available from HMRC's uh, uh, point of view, you know. Um, one would have thought that that would be the case. Um, just an issue that hasn't come up actually from committee, but uh, under current government proposals, I've been a, a, um, of reducing uh, government borrowing, so there's a 1% surplus by 2020 by reducing debt. That would still leave uh, a deficit of about 54% of annual income in terms of the amount of, uh, of money that would still be outstanding in terms of debt. Um, what's it, how is it, assuming all went to plan, of course, um, 
That 54%, how does that um, stack up in historic terms, in terms of the UK's uh, debt? Um, so the, uh, so I think, so I think that not talking about boring. Might, where you might end up in 2030 yeah. if you ran 10 years of surplus. Sure. Now we've never done anything even approaching 10 years of surplus. So sure. I think you know that's uh, um, yeah, that would be a wonderful world to be in. Um, the um, you, we've got debt at around 80 percent of national income now. Mm -hmm. That's the highest it's been since 1967. So, mm -hmm. uh, but if you look over a much longer period, um, uh, you, you have these kind of big cycles. So if you look. Over the 19th century, you see debt um, starting off at, I don't know, 100, 150 percent of national income after the Napoleonic Wars, gradually coming down to you know, really quite low levels of maybe 20 percent of national income, then shooting up to 150, 200 percent over the period covering the First and Second World Wars, um, and then a fairly sharp decline right through to the um, 1980s. So you've actually got, um, as I say, you pass through 80% back in 1967, um, and then uh, you, you kind of, you, you get down to, I can't remember what sorts of numbers, 30, 40, 50% in the 70s, 80s. Um, you get down to 20 or 30% at the beginning of the 2000s. Um, it's heading up to 40% in 2008, um, which was the cap that the last government said they wanted to put on it. And it doubles essentially between 2008 and this year to um, to, to, to 80 percent. So, um, if you look in relatively recent history, 80 percent, as I say, is the highest in 50 years. Um, if you look over a much longer period, um, you have these long periods of paying down much higher levels of debt following following wars. Yeah. So governments have long experience of having to deal with similar type of deficits over many years. Yeah. Okay, and just the last question was in, in terms of the, the issue that obviously uh, Jackie Bailey uh, raised. Uh, Jonathan Ports, the director of the National Institute of uh, Economic and Social Research, uh, said that, uh, and I quote, there's quite a lot of room for manoeuvre in terms of plans to get the deficit down over the next parliament. Uh, even what Nicola Sturgeon is proposing, which involves spending quite a lot more and borrowing quite a lot more than what the Conservatives are proposing, would still result in a falling deficit and falling debt over the parliament. So it would be fiscally sustainable. Uh, uh, would you share that? That view, given what you've said about the the size that debt has been historically in the UK, um, I mean, I, I mean, I think there are trade-offs with uh, you know, with all of these things, and the I mean, and I think the big trade-off is um, wh wherever you get in 2020, um, you will have significant, but uh, I think you're right, not um, a significant amount of debt, not debt that you can't cope with. Um, two things then happen. First. We will get another recession at some point. I don't know when, uh, but you know we're not going to we're not going to get rid of boom and bust. Um, and one of the questions I think you need to ask yourself is: Had we gone into the last recession with debt at eighty percent of national income, it would have then gone up to one hundred and twenty percent. I don't know whether that's a sustainable number or not, but there is clearly more risk associated with going from eighty to one hundred and twenty than there is from going from forty to eighty. Um, mm. And a second, but you, you mean you, you, first of all, we, we wouldn't know when or if another no, recession was going to no, come absolutely. or what the extent of it. I mean, yeah. surely. I mean, I, and that's why I think you know, I, in a way, I'm not sure economists can really help. I think there's a kind of uh, incredibly difficult judgment about risk here. Um, and the second thing is that, as I as I was saying, the um, you know, over the next twenty or thirty years, the uh, pressure on public services is is, is, uh, is only going to grow, particularly because of demographic change. Yeah. And it's clearly easier to deal with that if you're starting with a, a, a lower deficit and debt to start with. Um, I, I'm going to duck the question. I think it's great that the electorate has these choices because I think these are real choices. I don't think any of them are stupid choices. Um, and I think they're taking a different view about where the risks lie. Okay, thank you. I mean, so, so when God, you, you mentioned boom and bust. So when Gordon Brown said he would uh, he'd bring an end to boom and bust, do you think he was half right? No. And <laughs> He's ended the boom. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Is there any further points you want to make to committee before we wind up the session? I think I've said plenty. <laughs> I have to be honest with you. I mean, I, 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 my, my, you know, hat comes off to you, actually. I mean, uh, Paul, you know, every day you come up and give a, a sterling show for more than two hours answering questions across a huge spectrum of areas. So thank you very much once again. Uh, for coming to committee. We very much appreciate it. I'm going to call, um, given the fact that we have been in session for two hours, a, a 10 minute recess um, and we'll uh, reconvene um, at 11.40, uh, 11.50 around about then. Okay, thanks.
Have them go. Or there he is. Gavin. Just. remind all members to please switch off all electronic <laughs> devices. Um, now, we have uh, 10 minutes before the Cabinet Secretary is able to come to committee um, due to uh, other engagements. So, therefore, if with the committee's agreement, I would be happy to go into private session and deal with um, uh, our item on our report on uh, LBTT subordinate legislation. Are colleagues happy for us to deal with that? In, yes. Uh, okay, so we'll take item uh, seven next. So therefore, so if we can just uh, call, uh, well, not call a recess, but just ask the uh, the, the official report in public uh, to leave just for a few seconds, and then we'll go straight on to uh, agenda some seven in private.
rock and roll. Um, our next item of business today is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy on the Budget Scotland Act 2014 Amendment Order 2015 uh, draft. The Cabinet Secretary is joined today by Scottish Government officials Joe Welsh and Martin Bolt. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting and invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. The Spring Budget Revision provides the final opportunity to formally amend the Scottish Budget for 2014-15. This year's Spring Budget Revision deals with three different types of amendments to the Budget. Firstly, a number of technical adjustments that have no impact on spending power. Secondly, a small number of Whitehall transfers. And finally, some budget-neutral transfers of resources between portfolio budgets, including a modest budget redirection to ensure that we maximise our available budget. The net impact on all of these changes is an increase in the approved budget of £475.1 million from £36,431.4 to £36,906.5 million. Table 1.2 on page 6 of the supporting document shows the approved budgets following the autumn budget revision as realigned to reflect the new portfolio structure announced by the First Minister on the 21st of November 2014 and the changes sought in the Spring Budget Revision. The supporting document to the Spring Budget Revision and the brief guide prepared by my officials provide background on the net changes. <coughs> the first set of changes comprise a number of technical adjustments to the budget. The technical adjustments are mainly non-cash and budget neutral and have a positive impact of £452.2 million. It is necessary to reflect these adjustments to ensure the budget is consistent with the accounting requirements and with the final outturn um, that will be reported and in our annual accounts. In my letter of the 2nd of February to the Finance Committee, I provided information on the Scottish Government's response to updates to relevant Eurostat technical guidance on accounting applied from September 2014 in relation to NPD hub projects. In the interest of clarity, I should advise members that the contingency arrangements I have agreed with Her Majesty's Treasury do not impact on the Spring Budget Revision as these relate to HM Treasury budgeting at a UK level. This should not be confused with the routine Scottish Budget adjustments that are made each year in relation to revenue finance projects. The Scottish, government's al the Scottish Budget aligns with the accounting requirements under the Government Financial Reporting Manual. Accordingly, budget provision is included within the Scottish Budget for the financial year to reflect the recognition of relevant health and transport assets within revenue finance infrastructure schemes in accordance with the accounting requirements. In numerical terms, this is the most significant technical adjustment to budget at this spring budget revision with an adjustment of £253.4 million. With regard to Whitehall transfers and allocations from Her Majesty's Treasury, there is a net positive impact on the budget of £22.9 million. The final part of the budget revision concerns the transfer of funds within and between portfolios to better align the budgets with profiled spend. There are a number of internal transfers as part of the revision process. These have no impact on overall spending power. The main transfers between portfolios are noted in the spring budget revision, supporting document and the guide. In line with past years, there are a number of internal portfolio transfers which have no effect on portfolio totals, but ensure that internal budgets are monitored effectively. As previously mentioned, the Committee will wish to note that as part of our robust budget management process and in line with good practice, we have taken the opportunity at the Spring Budget Revision to deploy emerging underspends to ensure that we maximise public expenditure in 2014-15, in particular to support capital investment where possible. The Spring Budget Revision records the deployment of some £115 million of redirected budget, representing around 0.4% of the fiscal Dell budget. Details are provided at Annex C of the brief guide prepared by my officials. The Spring Budget Revision also reflects the proposed transfer of budget from resource to capital in respect of the Scottish Budget, noting that the Scottish Budget records capital that scores in the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts or the accounts of our directly funded bodies. In the context of our HM Treasury Budget, the planned resource to capital transfer is £190 million. This switching is managed within the total Dell available to the Scottish Government. This takes into account the latest profile of the Government's overall capital programme. As in previous years, it is my intention to write to the Committee once we have provisional outturn figures with a table setting out the actual resource to capital transfers by portfolio and programme in a similar format to the table provided in my letter of July last year in respect of financial year 2013-14. 
As we approach the financial year end, we will continue in line with our normal practice to monitor forecast outturn against budget, and wherever possible, we will seek to utilise any emerging underspends to ensure we make optimum use of the resources available in 2014-15 and to proactively manage the flexibility provided under the budget exchange mechanism agreed between Her Majesty's Treasury and the devolved administrations. I confirm in line with past years that it is my intention to make a statement to Parliament on the provisional outturn in respect of both our Scottish Parliament budget and Her Majesty's Treasury budget. The brief guide to the spring budget revision prepared by my officials sets out the background to, and to the details of the main changes proposed, and uh, I look forward to discussing these questions with the committee. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And as you know, I will ask a few questions and then open the, situation, the, the, the session out to uh, members. Um, in the Autumn Statement 2013, UK Budget 2014, Autumn Statement 2014, uh, there was an additional uh, 158 million allocated in the 2014-15 Budget Bill, allocated 90 million of these Bandit Consequentials in the Autumn Budget Revision, another £53.3 .3 million. So there's about £15 million in Bandit Consequentials that appear to uh, be unallocated. I'm just wondering if you can uh, tell us whether they've been carried over uh, into 2015-16 using the budget exchange uh, mechanism. Um, th th there are um, remaining unallocated consequentials from, well there are consequentials that have not been um, put into budget measures so far, um, totalling £15 million. Convener, that's correct. We intend to carry those forward and 13 million of that 15 will be allocated to support the delivery of free school meals in 2015-16, which was part of our long-term planning for that policy. Um, there will be 2 million that is unallocated after the, um, the, the, those provisions are taken into account. Any other uh, funds um, that, have, that uh, are being uh, carried over, and if so, um, have they been allocated? Uh, there will be... Um, you know, I would expect there to be a budget underspend of the order of 140 to 150 million pounds, and um, that is factored into the spending plans for 2015-16. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much for that. I mean, you've, you've talked a lot about the technical transfers and. Uh, you said that uh, these are essentially budget neutral and do not provide additional spending power for the Scottish Government. I'm just um, wondering what the word essentially is doing in there, you know, I mean, you say essentially budget neutral, there's an implication that they're not quite, can you just um, clarify if that is the case um, or in fact that they are completely budget neutral? Well, the, 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 in the overall, um, in my statement that I've just made to the committee, mm -hmm. um, I made the point that... Um, there was essentially um, a net positive impact on the budget of £22.9 million. Um, but in every other respect, all of the other transfers are, uh, are budget neutral. OK, that, that's fine. So they don't really have any practical significance no. whatsoever. OK, that's fine. So to, to uh, double uh, clarify that. Um, now, in terms of um, uh, capital increases, uh, what resource budgets have fallen in order to accommodate these and what changes have taken place since the uh, plans were set out in the draft budget 15-16? Um, our expectation is that um, the resource to capital transfer will be of the order of... Uh, 190 million pounds this year. Um, our plan at the st stage of the draft budget was 120 million pounds, and essentially, what we are doing here is um, working the totality of our budget, the budget available to us, to ensure that we can fulfil um, a broad range of capital investments uh, across the country. Um, some will be affected by timing, where we are able to make more progress on particular projects than we perhaps envisaged at the time of the budget in 2014-15. So we're trying to find the headroom within the budget to enable us to undertake more capital investment work in 14-15 than we had previously planned. Um, so these will be a product of operational decisions within the capital programme. Um, and therefore, where we find these opportunities to undertake more activity, we will then um, try to establish the funding mechanism to do that. And one of the op options available to us is to undertake a greater resource to capital transfer than was planned. 
Okay, but you don't have any specific details of that? Uh, I can certainly provide the committee with um, a range of areas where um, we will do that. And I, I would also say to the committee that um, we will formally write to the committee once we've reached the end of the financial year, mm -hmm. when it becomes clear as to whether or not we have, in fact, undertaken all of that transfer activity that, uh, uh, that I've suggested will be the case. Um, Thank you. I mean, table three, you know, we have a, a source of emerging underspends. I'm just wondering uh, what some of the reasons are for some of these underspends. It covers uh, quite a, a significant area of infrastructure investment in cities, but also education, lifelong learning is a £13.4 million uh, underspend. Prison service, £12.3 million. Um, and there's £1.5 million for Scottish corporate body. So I'm just wondering if you can talk us through some of these um, Underspends and will the money be restored to these budgets in the future or or, or not? Well, some of the um, to go through some of the underspends, convener on rail services, for example, um, we have identified um, a number of savings uh, through a combination of the a reduction in the forecast inflation um, and the published control period um, price list. Uh, that's relevant to the access charges for network rail. So these are, you know, we make estimates of what we think they are likely to require in budget provision when we set the draft budget. But of course, as the we don't have that detail to hand as to what they will, uh, you know, what these costs, how these costs will crystallise, so that then um, we then have in a position where we can reallocate to uh, to support other provisions on. Scottish Water, um, essentially, and you know, we, we've gone through this territory before in, in mm -hmm. committee. Um, the infrastructure programme of Scottish Water will, um, will will change its shape and character depending on particular projects that are taken forward, and there will essentially be a net funding requirement that the government has to provide, and we expect that um, net funding requirement to reduce in voted loans to £106.6 .6 million, which will um, remove a requirement for £40 million of borrowing by Scottish Water. Um, on motorways and trunk roads, um, there are uh, in-year savings from the Queensferry Crossing. Um, so again, the Queensferry Crossing is uh, continuing to make good, well, very, very visible progress, um, but is also um, delivering uh, savings because of lower inflation and as the project takes its course and i think i've gone through this with the committee before um the way the contract is structured there is a fixed price for the whole project but there is then um essentially a, a, a contingency element that runs alongside that for variables that are out with the control of the contractor and if we if those those that contingency is only accessed if it is, if there's a proven need to access it, and where it's not needed, it then comes back to the government, and that's what we're essentially gathering back. In the funding council, um, there are savings because of um, the changes to the timescale for the delivery of certain programmes uh, that the funding council is taking forward um, uh, as a consequence of uh, some of the activity around carbon reduction and uh, other projects. In the Scottish Prison Service, um, there have been um, essentially changes to the cost of energy supply and energy usage, court custody um, contracts coming in at a reduced uh, price than was anticipated, improvements in uh, estates maintenance, which has delivered more efficiency, and, and the, the savings have come from there. And... Um, the corporate body has been able to release £1.5 million pounds of savings, which is not a budget I control, but is always welcome to have it when it comes. OK, thanks. But will, these, will any of these um, funds be restored to these budgets, or are they going to be put into...? Well, these are reallocated to meet other provisions within the 14-15 budget, but where, Indeed, but if, there's, if, there's an element of, if there's an element where, for example, a project <coughs> hasn't happened in this yeah. year but will happen this, in the following year, we will restore the budgets accordingly. Excellent. Thank you for that clarification. That's sort of seeking. I kind of 
more ham-fisted way than you put it eloquently. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, just one further question, which is in terms of the issue of infrastructure and, uh, uh, investment in cities. And, uh, the four proposed reductions in rail services budget totaling £74.1 million, and one of them includes a £23 million transfer to ferry services for contract commitments. I'm just wondering if you can tell us a wee bit about that. Um, essentially, what this is, uh, is dealing with is the um, higher support that the government is, well, the, 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 the origins of the saving are the ones that I shared with the committee that the, the lower price inflation um, on contracts and the changes in network rail access charges, which have been the source of that particular change. And then the transfer into the ferries budget it takes account of um, uh, additional uh, budget cover that we're putting in place to support and to sustain ferry commitments, which are, of course, vital for many com communities around the country, not least of which in your own constituency, mm -hmm. Convener, in Arran, and it's designed to provide the support that's necessary for our uh, essential ferry services. OK, well, thank you uh, very much for that. We have some members who are keen to ask questions. The first one will be Gavin, to be followed by John. Well, thank you. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, on the, firstly, then, on the, the Scottish water saving is £43.5 million pounds less uh, than was anticipated for 1415. Does, does that impact at all on what you would need to uh, lend to Scottish Water over the longer term, or is that likely to, to pop up in future years? Um, in the technical terms, pop up. Pop up sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the first one that came into my head. Uh, I, but I think, I, think it, I think it makes the point, Mr Brown. Yeah. Yes, okay. it, it will pop up uh, okay. at a later stage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Next question. The, you referred to your letter of the 2nd of February to this committee. Um, I just want to double-check I heard you right. Did you basically say that there's, in terms of the spring budget revision, revision there's nothing from your letter is actually correct. captured That's correct. in this document? That's correct. Perfect. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, you some of the underspends quite clearly. Do you, do you encourage any departments to underspend? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, for two reasons, um, you know, one is that um, I have to I have to underspend. It's you know, and I defy anybody to believe that it would be possible to uh, spend precisely the amount of money is allocated to us in any given financial year. Now, the arrangements we have with the UK government, which allow us to um, carry forward a very small proportion of our budget. Um, I, you know, I, the numbers used to be ingrained, but it's around about 150 million of resource, about 40 million of capital. I think it's about 0.6% of our RDL budget. Um, it's a sensible arrangement because it means we have to plan to to balance our budget, which you know, and if we plan to 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 hit it on the the nail, it would be. I think it would be very risky to try to do that. So a modest, and then we have an arrangement with the UK government, which essentially allows us to carry forward without any loss to the Scottish public purse. A modest underspend that enables us to manage that in an orderly fashion, and I'm entirely satisfied with those arrangements. So that's one reason. And the second is that, of course, um, different things happen during the year in which I have to find resources for particular priorities. So it helps to have portfolios that um, are able to identify savings. And to be prepared, and of course this is a this is one of the strengths of the, the administration, and portfolios are prepared to offer those into uh, for consideration, but they're obliged to offer them into uh, my office for consideration as to whether the resources can be deployed within portfolio or deployed on uh, corporate priorities. Okay, thank you. Um, can I refer to page 65 of the supporting document? You, in answer to convener, you, you said there was a bit of an underspend in rail services, partly due to reduction in inflation, and a couple of uh, other reasons were given. But if I look at if I look at that table as, uh, as a whole, the original budget for rail services was 842.8 million, 
and the actual budget now as a consequence of the autumn budget revision and this budget revision will take it to 757.4 million pounds so that's um, that's quite a drop from the original budget. Is all of that explained by inflation and other reasons, or are there other bits in there that I mean, are services affected at all, or any projects delayed at all, um, or is it all explained by uh, inflation? It's explained by um, a combination of a reduction in forecast inflation, um, the published control period price list relevant to um, the network rail access charges um, and yeah that's what it's explained by yeah okay so that, that would explain the whole the whole difference okay um, if I can go then to page 60 uh, 68 um, of the same uh, same document um, just one one bit here I've in, in Schedule 3.4, you've got technical budget adjustment in respect of transport revenue finance infrastructure projects. So there's a, I mean, it's described as a technical adjustment, but I just want to, to dwell on it just because of the size of it, £201.8 million. Yeah. Can you just give a bit more detail on that? Please? Yes, it's, it's technical um, adjustments uh, about the, um, the provision for the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route and the M8, M73 and M74 project improvement projects. And in connection with AWPR, it's 66.7 million. And in connection with the M8, M73, M74 projects, it's 135.1 million pounds. Now, wh what this has arisen from is essentially a response to a point raised with us by Audit Scotland, where what we would normally have done would be when a project that was revenue financed was completed, we would have then put that, we would have used, uh, 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 well, it's, uh, it's called uh, ODEL, outside DEL. It's a provision to essentially recognise that in our, um, our asset base. Audit Scotland have indicated to us they think that we should show that piece by piece as it goes through its construction. So this is us essentially okay. responding to that uh, point from Audit Scotland. So uh, there will not be a number that crystallises <coughs> on these projects at a later stage that is, um, you know, that's the complete number. It will be done incrementally as part of the process. Okay, I'm grateful. Thank you. Um, on on the same page, uh, there is a planned or an emerging planned underspend of 17. Point eight million. Now, you, in response to the, the convener's question, I think you suggested that was down to inflation, but also savings from the Queensferry crossing. So, just looking for, I guess, a bit more explanation because, according to the spring budget revision, the table just below that, the Queensferry crossing has a figure of 250.2 million attached to it. But when I looked at the draft budget. <coughs> That figure was two hundred and forty one million pounds for financial year fourteen fifteen. So on on the face of it, it's it's nine million pounds more being spent on the Queensferry crossing than at least in, in the draft budget. So I'm just wondering how that works out at an underspend. I think we we might have to write to the committee about all of the transactions in here because I, I suspect on the there there may well be an issue about um, how much of what we show here um, crystallises onto our balance sheet. But I'll need to, right. I think I'd better sit, write to the committee on the detail of that question. What we, um, there will also be, um, There may also be um, other elements of funding that may be part of this equation here. So if I, for I'm completeness, sure. I'll oh. give the committee all that detail. Okay, thank you. And uh, my last question is, page 75 uh, of the document, uh, there, there's two entries there on, on Schedule 3.11. It's the, the top two under summary of proposed changes. Transfers from portfolios to support 
corporate procurement functions and then deployment of underspend to support corporate procurement function, functions, 6.2 million and 12.4 million respectively. Um, I'm just, I guess I'm just seeking an explanation of what is meant by transferring to support corporate procurement functions. It's essentially doing is um, crystallising in one place the activity the government takes forward to operate a shared service for delivery of procurement activities uh, right across the public sector. So this is us essentially identifying in one place mm -hmm. um, the budget that's required to ensure that we operate a shared procurement service across the public sector. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're grateful. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, John, to follow by Richard. Uh, thanks, uh, Just a couple of questions. Um, page 37 uh, under justice refers to AMA provision ongoing legal case. I think we've got notes saying that uh, it's to do with something to do with the pensions. I realise if it's an ongoing legal case, you probably can't say very much about it. It just seemed quite a large amount for a legal case. Can you say anything about it? I can't say an awful lot about it, uh, Convener. This is a, a, an issue in relation to um, a provision of uh, pensions, which is the subject of um, a case involving the, government's act the Government Actuaries Department. But the Treasury have um, advised us that we should make Amy provision for this um, uh, should this uh, should this be required, and um, we uh, we have done so. Okay, right. I accept that. Thank you. I obviously, I'll, I'll happily share more information to the committee when I'm in a position to. As, do as so. things move forward, yeah, that's great. Um, and then the other bit was the Whitehall transfers allocation from HM Treasury, which is not a huge amount. The 22.9 million, which you referred to earlier, and that's made up of some relatively small amounts. Um, I, I just wondered the process of that. I mean, is that something that a, 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 there is negotiation about with yourself or individual departments, or is that a, something that's just decided and you're told about? Um, well, essentially, um, there will be a number of announcements, um, points made by UK departments from time to time. If I give the committee a flavour of some of these. Um, I mean, if you want to, the one I'm most interested in, although it's quite small, is the G8.8 million. As to whether that really is the cost or whether how that was decided. Um, well, this reflects the final outstanding costs in relation to mutual aid and the G8 summit agreement. And a, this is in connection with the G8 summit held in Northern Ireland in 2013 which I assume oh. Oh, right. we are getting, our t well, that will be, I would imagine, a transfer to us for support we provided from our resources to assist in the security of the G8 summit right. in, Northern Ireland, in Ireland. Northern Ireland. One, right. So okay. it's that, that's, yes, uh, right. Right. so that's okay. exactly what it'll be. It'll be, it'll be essentially it'll be the cost, I would imagine, of Police Scotland's contribution towards the combined security operation around the G8 summit in Northern Ireland. And from what you know, do we send them a bill, or do they just give us a, sh a, a figure, or maybe you don't know that often? Uh, we'll, 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 uh, we'll be, you know, these will, these will be some, these will be, there'll be resources agreed as to what we're going to deploy and what we're going to get paid for it. Right. Okay, thanks so much. That's me. Thank you, Richard. Questions on the education and lifelong learning budget. On page 25, the transfer from health of £2.3 million. It says, in relation to the Kalman report, can you give us some more details Cabinet Secretary, of actually what that means. Uh, this is the cost of um, the additional cost of extra medical students in Scottish medical schools resulting from commitments to implement the Calman report. It's very helpful, thank you very much indeed. And then finally, we discussed the underspend in the Shefka budget already. There was a total net reduction of £19.5 million. Pounds. Is all that deferred projects, or is that or, because also the transfer to the learning budget of 9.9 .9 million pounds? So I wonder why 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 that decision had been made to transfer to the learning budget from the Shefka budget. Well, some th th there'll be some be because of the um, the agenda that we're now pursuing in relation to um, uh, implementing some aspects of the Wood Commission report. Some of the um, yeah, there's a need to make sure that we have um, a very focused approach to how we use our resources to support the cohort of young people who will be in that age bracket. And 
there will be areas where the funding council is involved in supporting projects which take forward some of the work that's envisaged under the Wood Commission report. So some of the some of the the, the lines will be blurred in there as to uh, where the, the the resources should come from. And um, there will be other aspects of the um, the chef gander spend which we will have to make good in later years. You know, for example, mm -hmm. there's an underspend on the Roslyn Centre, which is a project that we've agreed to fund, and it's not. It's just we've not been presented with the financial okay. requirement at this stage, but we'll have to make that good in later years. But in terms of the transfer to linear budget, there's a deliberate decision to transfer funds from universities or colleges, I guess we don't know which, to other aspects of um, learning and provision or, or you know, <coughs> learning providers in well, relation to Wood Report. It's I mean. simply about, uh, it's about trying to, to ensure that agenda is able to take okay. its course with appropriate support. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Richard. Uh, we've now exhausted questions from the committee, so uh, under uh, agenda item four, we now move to the debate on motion S4M 12552. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary formally to move the motion. Uh, move formally, Convener. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I now put the question on the motion. The question is that motion S4M 12552 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed, yes. Members are agreed. I'm just going to call a one minute recess for a change of witnesses before moving to agenda item five. Evidence for the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and Economy on two statutory instruments relating to the Scottish landfill tax. The Cabinet Secretary is joined for this item by David Carucci and John St Clair of the Scottish Government. I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to make an opening statement explaining both instruments and remind him not to move the motions at this point. Thank you, Kavira. The Scottish Landfill Tax Administration Amendment Regulations Order 2015 primarily utilises powers in Section 15 of the Landfill Tax Scotland Act 2014, which relate to how material disposed of is weighed. Scottish landfill tax will be chargeable by the weight and type of material disposed of. This instrument sets out that a weigh bridge must be used to weigh disposals if a working one is available on site. This will help ensure the accuracy of tax returns and that Scottish landfill tax is applied fairly and equitably across all sites. Failure to use a weigh bridge may result in a penalty for an inaccurate return under section 182 of the Revenue Scotland Tax Powers Act 2014. Alternative arrangements will be made available on application to Revenue Scotland for Weybridge breakdowns or when an alternative Weybridge is not available within the close proximity to the landfill site. The remaining amendments address drafting recommendations identified by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and help provide clarity on the role of approved bodies in relation to the community's fund. The second uh, landfill tax instrument for the Committee's consideration today is the Scottish Landfill Tax Exemption Certificates Order 2015. This instrument stems from powers in section 11 of the Scottish Landfill Tax Act that allows for Scottish ministers to vary what is categorised as a taxable disposal, what is not a taxable disposal and what is exempt. This order provides Revenue Scotland with the ability to grant authorities that exercise removal powers in the Environmental Protection Act 1990 and similar legislation with an exemption certificate. This applies to any landfill tax liability that may arise from the clear-up of a site following an unauthorised disposal, for example in cases of illegal dumping and fly-tipping. This exemption applies to the subsequent correct disposal by the authority. The Scottish Government envisages that this exemption will be used by authorities who are unable to recover their costs from the responsible person who made the original unauthorised disposal and where landfill is, only, is the only practical destination for the material. This instrument will stop local authorities from being penalised financially for the remediation of sites which diverts resources from other core services. This proposal was consulted on over the course of last year. 96% of those responding to the question were in favour of the Scottish Government providing an exemption of this nature in order to help facilitate the speedier remediation of sites. 
thank you very much for that, Cabinet Secretary. I've got no questions. Any members of committee have any questions? Uh, no members have any questions. Are there under uh, agenda item six, move to the debate on the motions. If members are content, I propose to put a single question on both m motions. Are members uh, content? Yes. Members have indicated that they are. I, I'd like to invite the Cabinet Secretary to move motions on block. Uh, moved on block, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And I put the question on the motions. The question is that, mo the question is that motions S4M12550 and S4M12551 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Uh, members have indicated uh, their agreement. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials and allow them uh, to leave. And as we undertook the private um, part of our committee meeting, while well, we're awaiting the Cabinet Secretary, that is the end of today's meeting. Thank